Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is David Levitt with Hope of the Generations Church here in Thomason, Georgia. And we want to welcome you to this very special message that we have with Dr. Henry Wright and Pastor Donna Wright, who are the founders and senior pastors of Hope of the Generations Church here in Thomason, Georgia. Now, today we're going to be discussing a really exciting initiative that has been brewing in your hearts for quite some time. And it's, it's very special to all of us here, but I know it's been with y'all for a very, very long time, and we're excited to hear about that this morning. It's been developing for years. Uh, the timing of God is always perfect, and we believe it's a perfect time for this initiative to begin. Yeah, and I would agree, kind of being around the, the edges of it for a few years. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and get going. Now, you guys have been pastors for over 30 years, okay, and collectively upwards of 60 years. So you all have seen a lot of things in the body of Christ, some, some good things, but also some things that may be lacking, maybe some areas that perhaps the church is not being all it was called to be or originally intended to be when the Father set this in motion and, and you'd have the body of Christ. So I guess could you begin by telling us a little bit about uh, your journey in being pastors and, and how you came to see this need that we're going to be discussing this morning. Well, can I jump in before you do? Is it okay? Because I want to say that I'm so excited to be able to talk about something about the Hope of the Generations Church. We're known for many things, but we this is really where our heart really is, mm. okay? And so I just, we're so excited to be able to do this. Finally, it seems like you say many years, I feel like it's been centuries almost. So I, I know that you have a lot to say about this. So do you want to start it or do you want me to? Because well, you, you know, know, I have thoughts coming. That's a good thing. That many times we have the church, which is where people go and assemble. And then we have ministries. Right. And the... Uh, scriptures and the directive of the Apostle Paul didn't release ministries. It released the church to be the church to do the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. And this has been where we've been caught because we've found that the church doesn't really understand ministry as a church. So we farm out here and there and there and there. And, and, but the scriptures are very clear that we're one body. The church is not a box of the steeple. The church is not a place where you just go for an hour and that's your life. The church, by definition, is the people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Paul's writing said that God, by his Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, Jesus is a bishop of the church from heaven as a work of the Holy Spirit, wants to work through the corporate church, all of us. And that has been the battleground, that has been the disconnect, and, and we'd like to refocus on something that is what God intended, and that's the initiative. You know, uh, you've been on, how many continents have you been on? My, we traveled the world. I haven't counted continents. But I think that, well, I, uh, countries, I know he's been to 14. 14 countries. And I've been to 12. You've been yeah. to 12. And, and, and with the intent of, you know, spreading the, the message, the gospel, uh, spreading the truth, and one of the things that, you know, in our conversations, I've heard you say over the years, is when you go out, no matter what country, no matter which continent, you're observing many of the same things or the same deficits even in the body of Christ. And one of the things I've heard you say, maybe you could talk about this, is uh, when you go and do a conference or a seminar or something like that, it seems to be that these are people that have no direction, no shepherd perhaps. Uh, is, that, is that accurate, how you've seen that? In, in some respects, we've lost the heart of God and become just a religious organization. We've become an organization when we were designed to be an organism. And uh, in traveling, it was amazing because we've traveled so much in the world mm -hmm. that I'm reminded of a scripture that said, these are things that are common to man. It has nothing to do with culture, even though each culture has its, you know, pluses and minuses, it has nothing to do with language. But we have found, even in the Christian church, the same reality regardless of nation. And the diseases that we've run across in people and the need for uh, a proper church to be functioning for the needs of the people, 
we have found the disconnect in every nation we travel to. Now, in going out, we wanted to try to connect with the church, not the organization, mm -hmm. but the organism. We didn't find it. We found an organization that was resistant to the organism, and it was discouraging. Yeah, one of the things that I have to say that I, I acknowledged and saw. Now, Henry, of course, we were going with the with the ministry arm of being health and so of course people were interested in, in in diseases and needs and things like that and i would be like in the back of the room because i wasn't teaching i was with him and, and with the children, we, had our children. And we were raising the kids for the most part some of them we didn't take them to all the countries but one of the things that um i recognized was a lot of the things that they were needing help with yeah, we knew some roots to disease, but it was really more about they needed someone to be able to shepherd them, mm -hmm. not just, you know, slap this on them, this understanding, because they didn't have a support system to be able to really even help them walk what they were learning. So for me, I saw, you know, being a pastor, I saw they really needed a pastor to support them in the truth that we were bringing. And, of course, there was so much other truth that we weren't bringing because we were going there for a different reason. And, and so I, I saw that I just re my heart really ached because it's kind of like I just want to take them home with us. Mm -hmm. And at one point I told Henry, I said, Henry, we cannot pastor America or the, or the world. I mean, that's, you're supposed to have local places. And so, you know, I was just really concerned about, you know, what are we going to do about this? I mean, are we supposed to do something about this? And, and, and so the question would come to me is like, where do I go? You know, where do I go to hear the truth that I'm hearing to support me? And, and, and I, I would have to say, I don't know. It's not that I don't think there could be somebody, but you have to understand that most of the people coming to us were coming from all different types of churches, all mm -hmm. different, some not even churched. So like I'm a just, melting pot. Just, just, we, were a, we were a melting mm -hmm. pot. And um, so we were getting people from all different places. And so to be able to be a common denominator, if I can say it, it was hard to, we were it. We were it. And so then the tribe developed, you know. Well, can I ask you a question? Um, because you, you, you brought two terms that maybe, um, I'm going to ask you to define a little bit more for those that are watching. You said you, you called one thing an organization and a whole other thing, an organism. Yeah. Uh, those are terms that I'm sure those that are watching are familiar with, but maybe not in the context of uh, church. Could you, could you discuss that a little bit more? The scriptures are quite clear in the writings of Paul in Ephesians and in Corinthians that when one member of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Mm. That's an organism. And, and then in Ephesians, Paul taught us that the body is to be fitly joined together. Every part supplying the need. Uh, an organization will bring information but doesn't understand application. Without understanding application, the organism suffers. I've run across many, and I've had people tell me this, uh, many, many people that say, well, my, my pastor just brings a sermon. And, and after the sermon, he leaves and, and we just need some attention. So there's all kinds of programs mm -hmm. in all kinds of places that those people are farmed out to. Much of it not understanding the root problem, just, the, just trying to do something. And that's all good that we would try to help. Uh, however, uh, in fact, I had a, a pastor in this community years ago that know, knows what we do in taking care of people. Mm -hmm. Not just giving them truth, but helping them learn how to walk in it. Yeah, and uh, and he said to me, "So how's it going out at your place?" I said, "Are people still coming from all over the world?" I said, "Yes, uh, just hundreds all the time." He said, "Well, I I'm glad you're doing that, but he said, you know, in our in our in our church, we don't do that." I said, "What do you do?" He said, "I bring a sermon three times a week, and it's their job to get it, and my job is over." Hmm. Well, that's not a shepherd. And a pastor or an elder, a pastoring elder, which is a, the Bible calls them shepherds. Right. Uh, they're there to lead the flock into green pastures. They, you know, they, and, and 
one of the office, one of the, one of the parts of a, a pastor is to guard the flock against the bear. Well, that's what how King David learned. Mm-hmm. He, he took care of these sheep, and it qualified him to take care of people because he had compassion and he understood. And he would lay his life down on behalf of the of the flock. Well, the great shepherd that came from heaven did the very same thing, but he had tools. He brought truth because he was truth, but then he brought it down to a place where he had compassion, and he healed them, and he cast out their devils, and he did cures. He even raised the dead. And so it brought an application of the organism rather than just a theory. Mm -hmm. Now, a theory without fruit is vanity. It's like to say you have faith and there's no fruit of it. It's vanity because faith must always have fruit for the organism. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's when, when I think about, there, there may be a lot of places out there that have a lot of truth, but it's that day-to-day uh, working it out in relationship with each other and with, and with the Father, um, where that fruit really seems to come forth. And to do that, uh, the other area is, it's gotta be safe to do that. Right. Um, you know, not every, I'm sure there are some safe places out there, um, but that's not everywhere. And, and I've, I've even noticed in my own journey that it was difficult to find a safe place to, for lack of a better term, experiment with truth. You know, I, I grew, I got saved at one point in my life. <laughs> oh, that's good. And I, I was not young, I was 38. And I attended a, a very large church initially that did believe in healing and uh, but the only only people that could administer the healing was the elders and uh, they didn't really understand how to pray properly they did they, they prayed anointed with oil but i saw very little evidence of the fruit of it and then and then in those days there were traveling uh healers that were traveling in america that were offering healing, and they were, had conferences and crusades. And they would come to, to our church. So we had to wait for some special anointed person to show up. I watched them show up, and I saw very little evidence of healing. So it left me with a challenge. What are we doing? We're doing the same thing over and over again, probably with good motives, but what is the disconnect? And I began to see the disconnect had to do that we didn't understand organism. We didn't understand what the body was supposed to be. We didn't understand what truth was supposed to accomplish. And we didn't understand really what, who we are as the body of Christ. Right. Can I add to that? Because well, one of the things that I, 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 I saw in churches was that it was kind of backing off on what you had said. It's like they'd preach a sermon, the pastor would preach a sermon, and it might have been a great sermon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then what was happening is then the sheep were left to kind of assimilate or regurgitate or whatever the word you want to use and try to apply it to their lives. But they really didn't know how to necessarily do that, nor did they have this, the safety factor that you were talking about on how to even experiment. So it's not just about us personally, though it is, but it was also about what does body life look like? Mm-hmm. How So as pastors, we have to provide that safe environment so that the, the, the flock feels safe to be able to actually even make mistakes and it's okay and and so i think that's an element that was really missing that we saw when we would come across you know all these masses of people and and churches in themselves that there was never really that they they pretended to have it together Mm -hmm. but they really because they knew they were supposed to but they really didn't know how how do i get there i didn't understand the pathway to um Healing. They didn't understand the pathway to disease prevention. They, they just saw there was a need for healing, mm-hmm. even those that believed in healing. And that brings another problem is that uh, probably close to 80% of Christianity worldwide doesn't believe in healing today. They teach it openly that it passed away with the apostles. So we've got this great disconnect now that we've even removed who we are to each other and who God is to us in this very aspect of him caring for us by his spirit. Because the reality is that healing 
it, yes, it's great if someone miraculously gets healed or even, you know, whatever the case may be. But the reality is that it, it's more than that. It's, it's how do you interact in relationships. That's how you keep all of that. That's how you grow in all of that. And so just coming to a conference or just coming to hear us out, that was great. But something would ignite in them that was like, I, I'm missing a something. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me take this someplace. Because in this time together, we're going to go into defining the initiative at some point. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I was an outflowing of an initiative. It was the mandate right. to believers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I attended a very large church. I was just, I was just an attendee. Mm -hmm. I was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I wasn't anybody. And uh, yet I had this thing inside me that what I saw in Scripture... I didn't see really working in a church that said it believed what this said. And, I, and it bothered me. Why do we read this and I don't see it happening? And so I remember, this is a large church of 1,500 people. We had, we had, elder, had a dozen elders in that church. Mm -hmm. And we'd have uh, cell group meetings once a month. And, and as I was growing through this, reading this, and, and, and who am I, and... And in that church's position, only people that were qualified to administer prayers and learning with oil were the elders. Well, I saw believers could do it, not just elders. And then I saw that elders should teach the believers how to do something so the body could take care of the body. I didn't see that happening either. So this body of 1,500 was at the mercy of 13 men. And the rest of the body, well... It just flowed along the best it could. I didn't see the results. So that would be more organizational so, thinking. So, so I, I began to have, a, have, this is how God leads you. And in this conversation today that we're going to be in, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask God to speak to you. Absolutely. Because perhaps religion has canceled your appointment from heaven. Mm. And it may be time for you to follow your heart and not the ways of men, even if it's religious. You have to think about what I just said, mm -hmm. because I was one of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 we would have these cell group meetings once a month, and I was already praying for people, and they were getting healed. In G and I wasn't an elder. I was just a believer that had a heart for God. Yep. And, an and I didn't know where this came from, a heart for mankind. It came in spite of me. And so I'd pray for people. It's a true story. We go to a, an elder's house. I'm just moved by emotion here. It's okay. Because it's real. Mm -hmm. Is that we go to the elder's house and we'd have a, a teaching on some subject for a half hour. That's what you did. Which was not bad. Mm -hmm. And then you'd break for fellowship. You'd eat, hang out with each other, kibitz, carry on. And while that was beginning, there'd be a line of people formed in the living room wanting me to pray for them. They weren't going to the elder. They were asking, Henry, Henry, could, could, you, could you pray? I understand God's working with you. Now, I became a pastor eventually because people would not leave me alone. That's organism. Mm -hmm. That's what organism is. And, and Jesus came in spite of organization. The Old Testament church, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, was an organization of religion. He invaded it. He invaded it. <laughs> he invaded it. organization. He invaded it. Mm -hmm. And he brought something called life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And solutions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think he was anybody. And they told him, and one, some, one group said, you have a devil. Can anything good come out of Can Nazareth? Can anything come yeah. out of Nazareth? So he didn't have any honor. He wasn't authenticated by men. He was authenticated by his father as a work of the Holy Spirit. That's the secret of the organism. I just gave you the secret. Mm -hmm. That's the secret I just gave you. But I want to add to that, though, is that, yes, he was authenticated by the father, 
But the witness was in the people that he helped and who wanted to listen to him. Just like with you, it's like there was something that was that was the drawing card, whether it was the compassion you had for the people, whether I mean, it's it, something, you know, we bear witness with the Spirit of God. And so I just think that that's the same thing. It's the same thing that Jesus encountered. The people bore witness with him. And the same thing that happened to me, I've been around this thing for many years now, is that as God began to use me, people were coming that out of churches because they, they knew that God was working with me. Mm-hmm. And they would be healed. God healed many people through, through, as the work of the Holy Spirit, the Father did through Henry over the years. And these people go back to their churches with a testimony, and they were rejected. But I just want to say, honestly, Henry, yes, they were healed. That is definitely true. But I don't think that that was the main thing. The main thing was that they found a shepherd who was willing to pick the burrs, pour the oil. That was really what it was about. It was that there was a, there was a pastor who really, really, really cared. You know, when we even though you weren't a pastor, when we when we we first came into Georgia here because we had so many people, and they were so allergic to things. And I remember that we had about four of us, and we had uh, phone lines across America, different parts of the world, that went from 12 noon to midnight, six days a week, by appointment only, people coming in looking to be cared for by a shepherd Mm -hmm. that cared for them. Maybe one of you was one of them. (laughs) And and maybe, maybe, maybe you were. And I remember even after that, remember we were, were in that single wide <laughs> out there at the, at the retreat. And, and I would, because West Coast is three hours away, uh, midnight is only nine. And so I would be sometimes out there with a headphone set on my phone till three and four in the morning, yep. helping West Coast people in, in Alaska, in Hawaii, <laughs> in our bedroom. Yep. Because, and that was the heart of God through me. But the thing is, is, again, yes, they did have needs, they needed heal, but I would listen to you for hours upon hours upon hours, and it was, he was pastoring yeah. these people. Well, and, and let, me, let me ask you a question here, because this is, this is how you started, mm-hmm. and as we come to today, you are the senior pastor of, of an established church mm-hmm. here in, in Thompson, Georgia, out of all of that. Right. Uh, but there's a continuation and a journey. And, and what are some of the things that you have implemented over the years to make sure this, this local church has stayed an organism? What are some of those scriptural principles that you've implemented that has kept it from ever becoming an organization? Well, we've, we've done a lot of things in reviewing the teachings of Paul. Uh, Paul is the apostle of the New Testament church age. He established it. It wasn't one of the original 12. It was a terrorist that <laughs> had, a, had an encounter. And, uh, and so um, he established many things that we overlook today because it requires that we become involved with people. We actually get to know them, not just use the oil and hope they're healed, and then we move on. This is, a, this is a, 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 an organism. So I, I, learned, I learned in, in studying uh, how we should function together. And uh, especially when one member of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Mm-hmm. So out of that came something we practice in our church here as an extension of who we are as an organism, which we are, mm-hmm. is, is the For Our Life program. I mean, we were known for For My Life, and we're known in some parts for their life in, mm-hmm. in the past. But For Our Life is this body is trained with the oversight of our elders that the body ministers to people who need prayer every week here by appointment. And, and there are teams of people that go to church here that are being taught how to listen, how to pray, how to meet them. And then our elders, if we're needed to, we speak into it. Well, the elders also know exactly what's happening because we, we get reports. We get reports yeah. every week mm-hmm. about who's receiving ministry. Uh, and, and so we have an ongoing care program here that is not just a few selected people being burnt out with the mobs of people who are desperate, 
but this whole church is being designed to care one for another. Mm. That is the teachings, and our job as elders is to assist this body in being healthy, not just in freedom of disease, but being healthy spiritually with compassion, with care, and learning how to really love each other, not just tolerate each other. And so, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. So there's, there's this care aspect yes. of the day in, day out, caring right. for one another. What about um, uh, the assembling of ourselves? What, how, do, how do you, what, what is there in Scripture that, that prevents that from becoming an organization and keeps it or, um, in an organism where we can work together? Well, the, re, the, the biggest problem we have in, in Christianity, and I'm an elder in the Christian church, so I get, I get to speak into my industry. I'm not being critical whatsoever. Uh, I don't think that I am. But one of, one of, the, uh, one of the problems we have is the Christian church has slowly disintegrated into just being spectators in assembly. A few people perform for us, they sing for us, they preach at us, but we're not allowed to function in that assembly. Everybody, that is. And then, yeah. and then we have this time constraint of how long we meet. It, if it's over an hour in some sections, we're fidgeting. Uh, if it's an hour and a half, we're really irritated. And yet we have 168 hours a week God has given us, and we have problems with an hour. And what can you accomplish in an hour? Not much. And, and, then, and then the body comes together only to have somebody perform them. How can they? See, we, we're going to get into this a little later, I know, in this conversation, mm -hmm. but the pattern for assembly is well defined by Paul from the early church. When they came together, all of them, it didn't say one or two, it says all of them participated. I won't get into all the definitions, 1 Corinthians 14, but they all, it was unpredictable. You could have a, two or three prophets there that would speak, one would sit down, one would stand up. You could have people giving a revelation, people giving a doctrine, people giving a testimony, people, people giving a tongue, giving an interpretation. You had all of this unpredictable activity as a work of the Holy Spirit. The organization of the Christian church that it does not allow it, that type of unpredictability. Well, I want to say that for years, we, because anybody being to our services will see and we'll, we'll outline that later, but mm -hmm. we are different, you know. And I remember for years, Henry would discuss this, we would discuss this almost at nauseum, okay, about how we weren't even doing what he saw, we saw in the word on how, how an assembly should really look. Can I interject? Yes. Without changing. Yes. Because I, we were stuck with a problem. The people that began to come to the Hope of Generations Church were trained in the organization. Mm -hmm. We were trained in the organization. And, and, and so to, to try and change it into the biblical pattern yes. indicated you're up against tradition. You are. And tradition is religion. Well, and the unpredictability that he's talking about would cause, I mean, that means we have to do something. If we were going to go where we thought we were going to go, it means that we were going to have to just kind of jump off the cliff and hope God we had a parachute because that means that the unpredictability that was in the New Testament was going to happen in our midst. What were we going to do about it? Well, we spent a lot of time initially in every service, and it would take out probably 15, 20 minutes of every service. Half hour. <laughs> so much of a one-hour service. <laughs> yes. Just to let everyone coming be told how this was going to work biblically. Yes. And so we had an open mic. We had an earnest section. We wanted them to participate. There was a flow decently in an order that they could flow, and they all could be edified by whoever the Spirit of God was moving on in that congregation. And they could bring a scripture reading. They could bring a testimony. They could bring a revelation. They could bring, and there was a place for this body to suddenly become the body. And it took time because people, and then our services were not over in an hour. Sometimes, depending on the flow of the Holy Spirit, it could have went two and a half, three, one time, four hours. Well, people that are part of organization don't like that because mm -hmm. 
it's out of control. Uh, seemingly. Well, seemingly. seemingly. Yeah. But when you get into a service like that, you don't want to leave. Right. Because but, things are happening. But I have to say that with, with the correct leadership, right. because it, it's not chaotic, but everything can no. be done decently in order, yeah. and that's what needs to happen. But what it does do, it puts a lot of responsibility on the pastor and the elders because we have to make sure that what's ever spoken in public is correct. Yes. And sometimes it's not. That's true. <laughs> you, you know, a lot of people that um, are watching this right now, uh, they have come to one of the church services here at Hope of the Generations. Maybe they've, they've come, they've, they've spent a Friday evening with us or, or a Sunday or both. And, and those people watching, they may have been some of the ones that have asked this question, because I know I've heard it a lot, is where do I find a church that does church like you do? Um, you know, well, some, there may be some people watching that are saying, well, what do you do in church that you're being to talk about? So why, why don't we maybe go ahead and define what you were talking about, some of, some of Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 12, well, 13, and 14. I, I have my Bible open so I don't misquote it. But in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, when you come together, uh, let's see here, I can, I can find it. Um, let's see, I thought I had it open here. Uh, oh, here it is, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, that's assembly. Mm -hmm. every, every one of you, not a, one or two people performing for you, come prepared to be in the flow. Will you, how many times have I used that? that yeah. Is it in the flow? Could you explain the flow a little bit? Well, we have discovered that there is a God. That's good. <laughs> And he, and he really cares and, he and about the, the flow. Yeah. <laughs> he cares about the flow. And we know he's here because the Bible says that if we're assembled in Jesus' name, God is here. Mm -hmm. His spirit is here. So there's never any quite, we don't have to invite God here. When we walk in and we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes with us. And we teach our people. And he really would like to participate with us on behalf of the will of the Father in Jesus' name. So we come together with that expectancy. So there's no program. We don't print a program because it would be useless to do so. And so we come in, uh, nothing's planned, and, uh, and we just, maybe sometimes we sing first, sometimes maybe I'll have an exhortation or maybe I'll even have a teaching. Then we sing. So we, there's, no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. But in the flow, we have found every service here, there's a theme that the Holy Spirit will come through the people. And it begins maybe with a song. Maybe it begins with an exhortation. But in the midst of it, there's a quickening in the people that are in place here. There's a quickening. Well, I think there's a quickening in the leadership about what God wants to say. Because oftentimes, like when Henry comes in, I'll say, because often, because oftentimes I, I, I gather the music, I, I pray about it. So I'll say, Henry, what, what is it that you want to do? And he says, I don't have a thing to this morning. As soon as he goes up and looks in, in his Bible, bam, there it is. Okay. And how many times, Donna, have I started with that exhortation and I don't know the song list. No, because he has no idea what I, because I don't know what's going on with him. So I go to the back with my team and either the music either just really undergirds it or I even throw the music away because we've in the, in the midst of the service, we've actually preached Shifted. or spoke about everything on that list. So that's common. So what happens with them being disjointed things happening mm -hmm. or people performing pre-advanced? There's actually a move of Spirit of God in the people, including the leadership, so that at the end of the service, there's a statement God has made for our edification, for our direction, for our growth. And, and just recently in a church service, I, I just had this impression to bring this exhortation. It was about an hour long <laughs> to start a service. And when it but come, he didn't have anything and, when he came in. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything <laughs> I know. when I came, but it came in that flow. Is that? And then when you started the songs later, every song was what I had just taught. Yeah, and true. I didn't know it. 
So we got to sing the expression. And what was cool about it is because, and why you go, well, what, why, why was that needed then? Sometimes it is needed and some it's not. Is what it did, it, it helped the people marinate, if I can use mm-hmm. that word, what they'd heard, and they could give glory to God and gratefulness about, oh my goodness, what an amazing, um, what an amazing word that was given to my heart on how to, how to go on. Now, this is important because when we have this flow, the people are awake to it. They're, they're quickened. The Holy Spirit is there quickening to listen. I, I read a statistic recently, or recently, it's been probably five years ago, that I ran across probably is the average person that goes to a Christian church service and listens to a sermon by the pastor will forget even the subject matter of what was taught within one hour of leaving that building. That is a sobering statistic. Mm-hmm. So what's the purpose? We, see, we come into org- organization or ritual, we go through the motion, and it becomes instinct. The kingdom of God is not instinct. And it has become instinct. We instinctively go through our programs. Where is God? Does he have an ability to get in here somewhere? And what if there's someone in the audience that God is moving on by his spirit that can bring this incredible revelation, this incredible scripture reading? How can they fit in? They, they're not allowed. Yeah, so how, 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 how do you make provision for somebody in the audience to do that? To, to extend or to express what's happening in the flow? Well, before he, you answer this question, I want to say that, that everything we're talking about is found in the Word. Yes. We're, we're, we're do, the, 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 if you want to say the format, if you will, is actually in the Word, and you were beginning to, to read I that. Didn't read it you didn't read it, but it's there. We, we didn't come up with it. So you want to talk about yeah. where it's at, and yeah. then we'll talk about how we implement it. Sounds good. All right, okay. let's, let's do that. Help me out. <laughs> first, first Corinthians 14, uh, verse 1. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you, has a psalm. That would be a song. It doesn't mean you all have to sing solos. No. It means you, good for me. But you should have a song in your heart. <laughs> but you should have a song in your heart. And it may be that you have a song. Yep, We've had people get up with the orange card. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that later. Yeah. Which means I have a song. Sometimes you, you have a moving of the Spirit I of God do. upon you and you sing a cappello. I do. Uh, a, a song. You did it last Sunday. I, I, I do it as I'm, as I move to do so. And other people can do it too. Because it's in the flow. The song's in the flow. Which, which is just like, man, it's just like taking a great ride in the country. The scenery is great. Mm-hmm. But most people go through a church service like driving the interstate. Mm-hmm. They know there's scenery out okay, there. Okay, now we will take up the offering. You know, and now mm-hmm. so-and-so will sing a solo. Is there a rest area soon? Yeah. Um, has a song. <laughs> has a doctrine. What's a doctrine? Well, doctrine is not evil. Doctrine is the sanity of God's mind as found in Scripture. So that's the Scripture reading. And so somebody will get up in the flow because the Spirit of God's moving. They're activated, you know, not vegetating. And the, the Holy Spirit quickens to them a Scripture. They say, hey, this fits. And, they, and we'll tell them how we do this in a minute. And they'll, they can come and bring that scripture to us that amplifies the move of the Holy Spirit as we're together. Now, one has a, has a tongue. Wow, that's an unknown tongue. Uh, one has a revelation and one has an interpretation of what the tongue. Now, this sometimes is not allowed at all. So if a person has a, as a the Spirit of God is moving in an unknown language, then there must be an interpretation to that language by someone other than the person bringing it. Mm -hmm. And their scriptures approve all this, and I won't get into all of it. And then we have to decide, well, why did we have a tongue and interpretation? Well, the Bible defines that. There are unbelievers present. That they may be convinced that God is in our midst. If we're all like-minded, we're all believers, you should never hear a tongue and interpretation in a service. It doesn't mean a thing, a hill of beans. It's not more spiritual than just a prophecy. And so, so we, we, we teach our people how to move according to the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, covers every bit of a general assembly. And, and so uh, we want to make provision for that. 
the early church functioned as an organism. And that's part of our initiative. Yes. Is to, is to bring that back. Without, you know, talking about it any further. Is to bring back what was working by a work of the Holy Spirit in the first century. Because it has to be. And so, uh, and it says this, that all things, what's a revelation? A revelation is an inspiration of the Holy Spirit that brings something that's based on truth. It could be an experience. It could be an insight. It could be, and we want to hear it. Because the Spirit of God is able to speak through humans. If humans will allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them, the Holy Spirit will give them words they don't even thinking about. And that's, a, that's, that's something that's being lost because it's not allowed. And so the Spirit of God is able to give people thought, to give them, to give them, to give them speech, and it's able to let them prophesy. What's prophesy? Does that make them a prophet? No. Uh, prophesy, what's that mean? Well, the Bible defines uh, a prophecy. What's prophecy? God speaking by His Spirit through a yielded believer in a general assembly that the Spirit of God wants to say to that assembly for three things. And it's defined. It's not foretelling. It's not fortune-telling. It's for three things. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. What you heard by that believer that's yielded to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God speaking to that believer in the open assembly, you can judge it. Did it bring edification? Was it an exhortation? Did it bring comfort to me? Mm -hmm. So this is how God works with us as an organism. Edification, exhortation, comfort is very, very great for the soul and the heart because it makes us feel closer to God and each other. So like what basically what he's outlining is like when you come and assemble together, it really should be a good meal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and a meal is not consistent on just one thing. A meal is usually... A, a smattering of different um, things, savories, sweets, different things. And so God really does prepare a table for us. He does. He really does. He wants to. He wants to. He that, wants to. That's really what he wants to do when we assemble together. Right. He wants to prepare a table for us, and he really is the one preparing it. One of the things I want to say is that when, when these people come, um, well, gosh, my head is just going in so many directions right now, just the excitement about this, <laughs> is that when people come, it can't be manna from yesterday. When they come, just like when your foot hits up here and you look, open, flip open your Bible, God gives it to you. You know, you know Donna, I'm thinking about when it, when it doesn't work right mm -hmm. is when people are trying out for Nashville or they're trying out for... <laughs> they just want to be heard. And they prepare something... Yeah. Days in advance to try to slide in and make it fit, and they try, and, and yeah. you've even had heard them come trying to say, "Well, I know this doesn't fit exactly, but but, but it slides a little bit." Those people are speaking to themselves, but the believers, because they're here listening, it goes thud, and mm -hmm. everybody pretty much knows it. Remember the Gong Show? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and and so uh, the thing is, so God wants to prepare a table for you every time you assemble. You know the key word here. Yeah, and I may interrupt you, but. Here in 26, let all things happening in the corporate assembly meeting be done to edifying. Yes. You know how important that word is? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to say, Henry, as good as you are about tapping into the Spirit of God, and everybody wants to hear you say things, and we do all the time, is God, if we all just listen to you all the time and nobody else, it, you can even become stale. And I don't mean he is, but I'm just saying if that's what if that's the way it was, which it isn't. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. When you when you when you have a meal, mm -hmm. isn't it kind of boring to eat the same item you had a potato? Yeah. That's all you had on your meal. One, and that may be good. Yeah, it's delicious. And then every meal you had a but potato. But you had a potato and had a potato. And then after a while, you're tired of potatoes, and that includes being tired of Henry. But you might have loved potatoes, you know. <laughs> but, but and, and the other thing I want to say is that God re he views us as lively stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good lively stones. So we're not supposed to be just sitting here chunks of coal. Just 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 go ahead and tell you me know, something. You know what I said sometimes sometimes I look at uh, sometimes in organ, organ, organized religious churches we walk in as penguins. Yeah. We walk in, we waddle in, we sit down, we go uh-huh uh-huh. We get up and we waddle out. That is really really not what this is about. Is and it? you know, no, and I'm saying that a real shepherd's heart mm -hmm. wants to see the flock become all they're supposed to be. 
And if you don't give them the elbow room and the room to make mistakes, I mean, it's risky business having people come up to the open mic and what are they going to say? Well, that's, that's and one their of the, growth, you know? But see, that's one of the fears of elders overseeing an organized church. They don't want what's who is out here in the pews to have access to that venue of speaking because somebody might say something wrong and offend a visitor. Well, and you know, as as pastors, you know, we've been stretched a lot, yeah, okay? we have. I mean, it, it helped us to grow, to be able to have faith for this, to be able to believe God, and and it, and it took a while. In fact, yeah. we were, wait, before you go there, yeah. it, it, we were trying to remember when did we actually just jump off the cliff? You know, how long ago has it been? to be able to let the body function as the body's supposed to. We talked about it for years. And in the beginning, it was rough. It was not like seamless, like, oh, God, just whoo. Because people have stuff, and they're not used to breaking mm-hmm. the traditions. Even we had a hard time with it. Well, you know, and I think, too, I mean, what a let's say somebody does get up and say something wrong. Uh, why shouldn't that be viewed as just a great opportunity to learn something? Well, everybody, you, know? You, know, you know, it's happened, not often. But occasionally we've had an individual come in that had their agenda, and it may not have been the Spirit of God, that would take advantage of our open flow and come and say something that was absolutely unscriptural or not correct. Mm -hmm. Um, We've been known to stop the service, not embarrass the person, but say, okay, we've heard this, now let's go revisit the Scriptures and let's have a Bible study. And let's see what the Word says about this subject. And, and it hasn't happened often, but I have been known to do that. Uh, we don't want to embarrass the person, even if, it was an, even if it was not the Holy Spirit was working with them. Uh, you know, I remember one time years ago, I had a, when I was cutting my teeth on this thing, I had a, I, we, the church I attended allowed prophecy and so on, and people to come and prophesy. Not open mic like we have, but just to prophesy. And I remember one time uh, there was an individual got up that that really wasn't the Holy Spirit. And I remember what the pastor said to him. He said, you know, what you have said doesn't bear witness. And he said, and you might have a, a, a spirit of divination that's helping you think. So why don't you meet me in my office on Monday morning so we can get that spirit of divination out of you so you can hear God more clearly. And then you can participate when you're free of that. That is an excellent pastor. You know, you you said something, because that's correct, because you said something, David, so it should be a good place to learn. It's like, I think that mankind as a whole just don't ever want to be wrong. They don't ever want to make mistakes because it's viewed as a judgment, you know, and and it in re- in reality, if we do, if we don't have the opportunity to fall, <laughs> I'm I'm remember I'm remembering something. What? But which one of the apostles? There were some people interfering with the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. And what was it? Who was, which one said, "I'm I'm going to call fire down from oh, heaven"? Oh, can we call can, fire? Can we call down? fire? Can we, like, that? can we call fire down from heaven and just kill them? Yeah, yeah. Shortcut. That was yeah, a shortcut. That was a, that, was, <laughs> and that, that wasn't just an ordinary belief. That was a staff member of Jesus. That was Jesus' team members. And, and I remember what Jesus said to him, "What kind of spirit are you of?" Yeah. <laughs> Son of man has come to you know. To save life, not not to kill it. So you know, you you have these moments. Yeah. yeah. And but this part of the growing curve. I don't think the church has made a provision for failure in the learning curve. Yeah. We must make a provision for people to do it wrong, and then help them do it right. right. But there's such a fear of being rejected and yes. publicly reproved. Yeah that we shrivel in fear. Mm -hmm. But if we all love each other, which we do, and I have to say that our body has grown up so much in this, and we're just so, so thrilled with where they're all at and what God has done. Mm -hmm. And it does take time. It's not like a light switch reality. Because, like, again, breaking traditions, breaking out of those fears, it it, it takes some time. You know what's really wonderful? And I I honor our, our flock members that when they do this, I mean, the Spirit of God is really moving strongly in the subject matter. It's bearing witness with so many people. Sure. And they're like little firecrackers. Yeah. And, and they'll, they'll pop up wanting to share, but it's already been shared. Mm-hmm. And so they're sitting there waiting their turn, and they wait a minute. What I have popping in me has already been talked about. And they recognize it, and they get up and go back and sit down in their chairs. And they don't say anything. 
And that is a sign of maturity. We call that hearing God twice. Hearing God twice. So you said something. You said they get up, go back. What what is what is it when they get up and go back? What are they going back to? Are they checking in with somebody? What does that look like? Now they they went back and sat down in it where they were sitting because they recognized what they were going to share has already been shared. So what David's actually asking is like is like how do we do this? You know, so so what happens is they Want to talk about it? Yeah, okay. what I'm is that we 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 announce usually we do at the beginning of the service what we're going to do, but we kind of gotten lax because we think most everybody knows You're talking about the order of the service. Right. Mm-hmm. And so what it is if someone has a prophecy, if someone has an exhortation, if someone has a testimony, if someone has a psalm or they have a song on their heart that they believe fits in the flow. We've even had the other. The other card was like a poem or something, but yeah. we don't use that very often, but sometimes. They go back to someone sitting in the back, which is usually a, a, a deacon mm-hmm. or an elder, and they check in with them and they say, I really believe I have this. And they will listen. And they'll go, and and then the the deacon or the elder will decide whether or not you know. I think that really does fit. I think they're really hearing God. So there is a check and balances. It's not you know just everybody gets to willy nilly do stuff. They take a they have a card, a particular card that they have in their hands. Has a color, right? That has a color that tells those that are actually in the front who is leading the service that particular week what they have, so they know when to fit it into the into the service that we're doing and we at the front not the back but the right. front on each wing of our where we meet mm-hmm. we have some colored chairs That's true and one is the open mic right and then we have a special podium just for the flock then that is another podium over here we use when i teach correct so the one that's over to our right right now sitting where we are now has a microphone on it mm-hmm. and it's for the whosoever coming that want to share. Now, of course, we ask them, please make it three to five minutes mm-hmm. because we want to give everyone who's who's being, you know, led by the Spirit of God to give, we want them to be able to have a chance. You can't go on, you know, and preach a sermon for 20 mm-hmm. minutes. Now, I will say this, though. If someone submits to the eldership that they believe they do have a word for the body, they submit it to them, and oftentimes that happens too. But that that's a pre kind of let's think about this kind of thing. Um, but that's how it works. And and so they have the card. We know when to release them. And we always give preeminence over prophecy. To prophecy. Yes. So if someone has a prophecy, they're going to get, they have a prophecy, and they have a, the card that denotes that. There's no spiritual meaning to any of those colors that we give them, by the way then we, we um, give preeminence to prophecy. So they, they, they're released to come and sit in the open mic section near the front. They sit there with a card visible so we, can, so we here can, can see the color because we don't have discernment otherwise. Right. And then in the flow of the service, we will release whatever that color. It could be green for testimony. It could be yellow for exhortation. It could be purple for prophecy. It could be... And those colors tell us what that person has going. So it's, it's there's a lot of, you know, we, we, we're flowing together. So we know where to insert it because right. we because we still, as, as elders, we still have the responsibility right. for what happens. And sometimes we sense that, that the Spirit of God has accomplished what the Father wanted for our service. And since everybody's now act, activated they suddenly become exclamation points of something that has already been said. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we'll just close that section and say, thank you for hearing God. But we feel that God has, has really accomplished what we really are hearing here today. And, and the flock is not a rejection. Uh, sometimes they hear, they hear it for themselves and say, no, that's already covered. You know what's really funny, David, is every time Henry and I get in the car to leave, Every time Henry and I get in the car, we think that was such a great service. Every single time, it's like <laughs> you think that it can't get any better from that one, and it does. I don't know. I tell what you, happens. it's it's so powerful what happens here, yeah. because you have this incredible service. I mean, you just you know, and you go, how can this be replicated again? It can't be. <laughs> it can't be. But but it's it's so good. You figure it can never get better. But every week we come together, it's. Better. And I know a lot of you out there actually do watch church services, and I know I've heard you're uh-huh. edified as well, and it's like, wow. 
Uh, let me ask you another question because uh, you know we've discussed about how there, there's an open mic here. There's a there's a place and a provision for anybody mm -hmm. in the flock to speak into the flow and, and hear God. Um, but there's also this aspect that you've been discussing uh, around organism about when they cry, cry with them, carry one for another, bearing each other's burdens. Is is there is there something else that we have in the corporate assembly that that is a provision for that? We do. We have another section called the earnest section. I was always uh, I was always impacted by church history. Way back in the early times of the growth of the Christian church, they had a section called the anxious seats. Anxious seats. Wow. Anxious seats, and it was a very wood, a wooden bench over here to the side, and if uh, a sinner was there and he was being convicted to give his heart to God and become born again and become saved. He would go and sit in the anxious seat saying, I'm anxious to make a decision. And it meant, I want to, I want to get saved. But he would go and sit there and they know what he was there for. And he didn't have to wait until the end of the service. When God was dealing with him or her, they went and sat down and said, I'm ready. That always impacted me. Because sometimes in our in our organized churches, we have to wait for the right song at the end. Mm -hmm. but altar that's a, call or something I, like that's that. It's called an altar call. Yeah. What That person may have already listened to the devil by the end of the service. <laughs> because it's a battle for their life. That's true. If they're ready, I had years ago a man walked in here specifically being dealt with by God. And he came in here and we had this kind of setting where we have the earnest, you know, the earnest section. Mm -hmm. And he got right up. And went back and came up and said, I came here to get saved. And it, and it didn't, wasn't at the end of the service. It was right there. I came to get saved. Now, that has, an organism will make provision for that. You know, and I was remembering another situation where there was a, a girl that we knew very well. And she was not born again, but she kept coming because she just did. And, and there was a song that really touched her heart and you know, backed up with all the stuff, words she'd heard. And she just jumped up and she went running back and she goes, she went to the front and goes, I want to get saved right now. Hmm. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. And you can't tell God to be quiet until you're ready for him to speak. That's the seriousness of an organization. It controls God. Hmm. An organism is an expression of life all the time. That's what an organism is. That's what the body is to be. So the earnest section isn't always about just getting saved, though. I mean, we also use it for other reasons. Yeah, you know, there are people that come that want to confess sin. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another. What's that? This is the best place. So our, our General Assembly has to be a safe place without stigma, without rejection. I mean, I had a, I had a lady come in here years ago, hit the earnest section, that came and confessed bestiality. Was, was so tormented in mm -hmm. it, just needed deliverance in prayer. We didn't go, we didn't ostracize her. I didn't go, oh, my God, get out of here, pervert. I said, thank you so much for your honesty. Now, I do want to say with that, um, when they're going to go and they're going to say something that maybe is a, more, a little more R or X-rated, we do ask them to please, can they... Can they filter it down because sure. because our children stay with yep. us? And we do, we do give that any instruction, yes, and, and our elders and our deacons will say that in that particular case. Uh, but there are people who just want to confess sin. Others are people that just want to be prayed for. And, and so my, our position is this. If you're earnest about God at any moment in the General Assembly, we're earnest about God with you. You don't have to wait if God's working and dealing with you, we're going to stop a service and let God meet you in the areas of your life that you need to be met with. That is how an organism is to function. So for those listening, I, I kind of want to summarize this if I can. God has placed in the Word the format for this, if you will, in 1 Corinthians 14. It's a place where the whole body can feed into a flow where, where God can deliver a, or let me say it this way, impart a message yes. to the body, to the flock, using the whole body under the oversight of shepherds right. and elders, okay, to accomplish something. Right. And in that, there may be confession of sin. There may be somebody getting 
born again saved, it may be through song. As you mentioned, you know, we, we keep our children in here with us. So it's not just uh, an impartation for adults, it's an impartation for the whole family. Now people come here and they experience this and they're impacted. And why wouldn't they be? Because the, the Spirit of God is going to honor something that is according to the Word. And so they ask questions. They ask questions like, where do I find a church like this? Or, or here's one we get after spending some time with us. How do I, how do I go back to my more organizational church, if you will? Okay, they don't say organizational church, but I'm adding that in there. Yeah. How do I go back to my church that operates more as an organization after I've tasted the organism? Uh, you know, how, or, or, or there may be some that are thinking, how is it that I can maybe begin to implement this wherever I'm at. And so I want to begin to move into this initiative mm -hmm. that we're here to discuss today right. uh, with y'all. Uh, what is this initiative that could fulfill, not just here in Thompson, Georgia, what we've been talking about, but anywhere in the world? Well, the problem is a problem that I have avoided for years. It's not a problem, it's a challenge. Well. It's a problem when you're Jonah and you've just been swallowed up by a whale and spit out on the ground and you still face your mission. No, I just, <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, Jonah, poor Jonah guy, he, he didn't make it, didn't he? I want to say that where we're going, Henry's drug his feet. And, and I don't, when I say drag his feet, it's not because he didn't see the need, he didn't see the the absolute yes we should it wasn't that it's just that it's it's a big endeavor here's here's yes. what I, here's in dragging my feet i like what you say that because i did <laughs> i i wanted the, the body of christ to do what they should do and i didn't want to interfere with that by drawing attention to myself because i saw it Mm -hmm. So I traveled the world trying to find like-minded churches that would embrace the gospel at this level, and I would assist them with the knowledge God had given me about disease and how to care for the flock so that they could care for their people. Yes. I spent over 25 years traveling the world to try to be a gift to the body to make the body function correctly in an organism. I ran into religion. I ran into instinctive religiosity. I ran into everything Jesus ran into in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I ran into indifference. I ran into arguments. I ran into people that did not want to embrace the teachings of the Bible. And that led me to a journey of what next? Yeah. Uh, and as part of our to discussing this initiative, I wouldn't have done anything about it unless I had not been forced to by a pastor. Well, I don't know <laughs> if that's true. Well, I mean, he, he, God used him, but even, even that confrontation of that pastor with me, we're going to get into this, has been how many years ago? Many. Many years ago. And even with that, even with what the initiative we're going to discuss has been on the drawing board for over 10 years. Maybe 15. Maybe 15. Has been on, now we're just here releasing the initiative. That's, I'm like a turtle. Well, I want to say that what he, we're about to release right now is like as his wife and listening all those years to all those sheep crying out for a shepherd, I was probably the, the noisiest in his ears, Okay. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to? we got to do something because something's got to happen. But it took this other pastor. That was kind of like the bam. Okay, we're going to go for it. Well, well, why don't you tell us about this confrontation with this pastor okay, and we tip the scales? <laughs> well, I was doing a conference in the western part of America. And uh, you give me a little okay. lozenge in my pocket. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. It's just dry air. <coughs> Got a little frog in my throat. It's croaking. And um, 
This pastor had come here to form my life. Okay. And was healed. And went back to his church with a testimony. Can you talk with us in your mouth? Uh, I'll try. Okay. Had gone back to his church with a testimony. We came to his area to do a conference. And he called me and said, I want to have breakfast with you before the conference. And I said, okay. So we sent in over a coffee before the conference. And he said to me, he said, when you were in Thomaston pastoring, that was one thing. But when you left the walls of your church in Thomaston and started to travel and do what you've been doing, he said, you left behind, including me, a lot of people that need you. Hmm. And, and I'm calling you on it. And he said, I'll never be the same. And he said, I'll never be the same. So I'm requiring that you be to me who you're supposed to be. And I said, what's that? He said, an oversight. You've released me from religion. I've experienced the power of God in my life. How can I pastor a church and then not include that kind of power? So he said, I hold, I hold you responsible for my journey from this point on. I said, go wow. away. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm not responsible for your journey. He said, yes, you are. And he wouldn't leave me alone. So I had, I had uh, dinner with my wife and he and his wife. And, uh, and then we talked. And, and then I sat down with him. Well, the subject came up again. The subject again came up again. again and again and again. And I sat down, and I looked at him, thinking, go away. <laughs> I'm already too busy. And he won't, he won't budge. And so I took a napkin. I went at a restaurant. It was a paper napkin. And I said, God, if you're really using him to speak to me, you better give me something to think about other than him in my face. And just like that, Scripture started to come to me. Right here. And I thought about the, the book of Acts. You know what the book of Acts is? The Acts of the early church. The record of those men and women who were newbies out of the shoot of mm -hmm. the Old Testament Judaism into this new life. They were newbies. And that's basically what this pastor was. He goes, I, I, I'm just been shot out of religion. Where, yeah. where am I going? Where, where, where am I going? What, am I going to, what are you going to do with me? I mean, you've ruined me. I want to be the same. So I, I wrote down this napkin. I'm talking about Acts. The Acts of the early church. Then I remembered 1 Corinthians 14. They were all activated. And I wrote this down. A-C-T-S. An acronym. Acts. A dot C. Mm -hmm. Acts. And I wrote this. Just wrote it. Didn't, didn't think about it. Just came. Association of Churches Teaching and Serving. The Continuing Acts of the New Testament Church. Recovering and Implementing the Integrity and the Power of the First Century Church. All on one napkin. I said, this is what... I see how I fit into it, I don't know. But this would be, and this was the initiative. This initiative came 15 years ago, not today. But it's been this long coming because there had to be perfecting, there had to be, you know, sometimes we, you may hear the call of God in your life, but it may take a while for you to grow into who you are. I became a pastor not because I went to some place that cranked me out with a diploma. I became a pastor because people would not leave me alone. In my first church I pastored, I was asked to come and pastor. And uh, they, because I was on Christian radio, as well known, mm -hmm. and uh, they liked how I thought, because they could hear me all over the place. I was on every week for five years. And... Uh, and so I had, to, I had to search from about an hour away from where I lived. Call me one day, would you come down and counsel with our pastor and our elders? 
Well, they had bad government. <laughs> what do I know about yeah, bad government? Well, they had bad government. And uh, I told them so. I said, uh, until you get proper government set in your church, you're going to have arguments all day long. And so they didn't like that. And uh, then about a month later, I got a call uh, to come down and said, would you come down and, and preach Sunday morning? I said, why? Well, the pastor's resigned. I said, oh. So I came and preached, and they invited me to come back and finally asked me to pastor. Well, I changed the government right away. And it worked. And about a year into this, people are coming from all over. The church was growing. We're in a small community. Mm -hmm. People are driving sometimes two hours just to come to a, a Sunday night service, for example, that started at 6 and sometimes got out at 2 o'clock in the morning. Incredible miracles, incredible healings, incredible. And people were coming. And the church was growing. One day the pastors, the elders of this church, I want to define something here in this story. Mm -hmm. The elders called me because I was still on the radio, and they called me. I would like to meet you at your house uh, after you get off the air. So we had one of these nail keg in your garage meetings with the elders. They gave me all the buttercups and all the wonderful things I'm doing. But they said, we have this one thing against you. I said, what is that? They said, we feel that on Sundays we should be able to come in, sing some songs, um, Hear a testimony, take up an offering, hear one of your great anointed sermons, Pastor, and be out in one hour. I said, really? That's what this meeting is about? Yes. I said, you got a problem with two people. They said, who? Me and God. You can tell God to go home at 12 noon. I don't dare. So here's the deal. At 12 noon, this is to my elders, you and your wives and your children leave. The rest of them are staying to see what God will do. Well, this went on for about six months, and finally they came to me one day and said, Pastor, we're all resigning. I said, why? Well, you know, God's moving here. He's doing great, wonderful, but, but we're more evangelical. We just want to get a few people saved, but they didn't want to take care of them. So we're going to leave and start another church that's more evangelical. We'll order it across the street. That church didn't make it, didn't survive, mm. because it removed the power of God and the heart of God and brought the organization and removed the organism entirely. You know, one of the things that made Henry drag his feet, I'm remembering, was he, didn't, he doesn't like denominations. He doesn't like denominations. So, Tell him why. Well, because it's a fraction of the whole. Fraction of the whole. And so he would say to me, Donna, I can't do this because it would be another denomination. And so we would have these um, uh, conversations concerning this. And, and, and I took the same position as this pastor did earlier by saying, I really believe that you really need to consider that you have something to give and, and oversight to give. So could you consider how that's going to happen? So when we had the napkin, we call it the napkin story because mm -hmm. you were down there. When we had that, of course, I sat there with a grin on my face the whole time because this was nothing more than a confirmation of years of conversation. And so, but at that time, that's when, when the association is what's the important word for, for Henry because an association does not mean denomination. Actually, actually, denomination and association are different. A denomination controls organization. Mm -hmm. An association is of like-minded men and women to accomplish the gospel. And since the scriptures are not a private interpretation, we should be able to read this and be in agreement all the time. We don't change God's word. We agree and say amen. And so denominations exchange in or out what they like and they don't like. Or they have reasons. So I'm not interested in part of the gospel. I'm interested in the whole gospel. And I don't think it passed away. I don't think half of it passed away. Mm -hmm. I think the New Testament church age began the day of Pentecost and will continue in someone and somewhere until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That has to be the message. So Acts, association of churches, teaching, and serving. Now, again, the church is not a box to the steeple. You've got to get this building out of your mind. 
You got to get the cathedral mentality out of your and mind. An organization out of the mind. This is right. not what we're talking about. So this acts is an initiative yes. to restore the organism. Yes. As is patterned in the first century. That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. We want to recover what worked. And we want to, you know, one, one of the things that is found in 1 Corinthians 12 is that God has set in the church, first apostles and prophets, workers of miracles, gifts of healing, and then there's the word governments. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem with governments. The kingdom of God is a theocracy. Not a democracy, not a dictatorship, but a theocracy. God said it, we said amen, and we believe it, and we practice it. So, in, in understanding this, uh, governments is not bad, because we, we, have, the, we have the elders, we have the fi we have fivefold eldership, we have the deacons, mm -hmm. we have the ministry of helps. So, governments is not bad, but government was not made for the people. Government is to assist the people in accomplishing the vision of the gospel, not interfere with it. Yes, go ahead, Joy. Well, so how do you, how do you plan on um, beginning this initiative? Because I know that Hope of the Generations cannot do this for everybody. We can't go into each city. There's just a right. few of us here, okay? So we, we're, and, and, and you're busy here too with, with this, your own local flock. So, so what, what, what's the, the format or the template in scripture? What, what is the, the plan, if you will, to, to establish an association? Well, the, the, the Apostle Paul uh, set it in order. He, as they began to expand the gospel outside of Jerusalem and in, into Asia Minor and all over, the instruction was given, go into every city and appoint elders in every city. Local elders in those cities. And local pastor. In this case, local a local pastor. pastor. Yeah. First, the fivefold eldership. First is the pastor oversees a flock. That's the church, is the flock. And so, because they couldn't be in every place at one time, even though Paul made his journeys to assist them, there had to be a local assembly overseen by a elder that would be leading this flock in two dimensions. Teaching them and leading them, and caring for them. So that would be to extend the mind of God and the will of God in the body, mm. the sons and daughters. Every born-again believer is a son and daughter of the Father. That is, n you can't make a denomination out of that. There's churches I, can, I can't walk into because, because I believe in healing. And they consider me a heretic because I believe God heals today. They don't consider me a brother. That's their sin. I'm just being blunt about mm -hmm. it. Because, it, it's, because it's, it's anti-Christ in his thinking. To say that God cannot heal but he can save is unscriptural. Because the scriptures are very clear. Which is easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven or pick up your bed and walk. Well, I've decided it is no more difficult to be healed than to be saved. That has to be center line of our belief system. I guess I'm, I'm over here. I, I look like I'm really calm and composed, but I'm so excited I can hardly stand it, okay? Because this is years and years of conversation, planning, and doing all things. And so the thing is, is like to me, I feel like we're unwrapping this present, and the present is is the answer to all the questions that come in. Mm -hmm. Where can I go? Where can I go? Well, we're trying to help you find a place to go because we are actually saying there are, you know, when when I'm gonna back up when they when David was called, not you, but King David mm -hmm. was called out of the sheepfold. Okay. We Saul wasn't, and that went miserably bad, okay, but David was called out of the sheepfold. He was. There's a sheepfold right now that we're talking to that there are those of you that are moved, thinking, could I be the one? But I'm just a shepherd boy. Or how about this? I don't know anything about anything. I just really kind of like people. I really do want to help. I do, I do feel like I have this, this thing where I want to take care and make sure everybody's okay. And, and that could be you, okay? 
And so you don't have to know, you don't have to been to cemetery, I mean seminary, you don't have to be any of those people, or maybe you did, and maybe you're just tired of seeing, you had, you, you know, I, I won't say that. Um, you really wanted to be what God wanted you to be, but you got caught in the in, in the cogs of, of the organization. Organization. Yeah. And instead of really letting the spirit of God move, I know anyone who's been here on a Friday night service says, wow, okay. Yeah, it was a little uncomfortable, maybe because there was kids making noises and stuff like that, because we, but there was the spirit of God really does prepare us a feast. He does, you know, and, and also uh, there's probably well over 40,000 people have come here to this little town south of Atlanta. Mm -hmm from all over the world over the past many years, mm -hmm. uh, looking for God. And they found God in many ways that they didn't find in their local church mm -hmm. because they, they, they couldn't find that place of, place of safety and peace and healing. Our, our, our thrust is this, is that we would like to see God raise up gatherings or churches, existing churches or new ones or new gatherings, we'll get into that later, where God can meet you, and we want to help you grow in that. Yes. So our venture, really, I'm going to use this word, is something I have resisted, is, an, is the office of apostle. Yes. Now, what's an apostle? An apostle is, is no big deal. It's a lot of work. <laughs> but an apostle oversees a mission. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really the definition right. of an apostle. He oversees a specific mission. Paul had a mission. He was given a mission. And so if God has... And, and all due humility has raised me up to answer the call of a pastor 15 years ago. The mission is this. I'm now, at my young age, uh, through the team that God has given us here, wanting to assist God in placing safe places of worship and assembly and gatherings all over the world. And we have many years of experience. We have the maturity. We have a good doctrinal foundation that's solid. It's Biblical. We believe all the Bible, mm -hmm. every bit of it. And so we want to release that so it would be better if you could get the same help in your community than you could get here. And that's our goal. So there'd be safe places of assembly and worship all over the world. And there's a key, there's a key scripture that really is driving me now. And that is a scripture that I've been talking about and talking about that's becoming like a light, a growing beacon. When the Son of Man returns, mm -hmm. shall he find faith in the earth. We want to release, and maybe God's calling you. Maybe you're a pastor of an existing church. Or maybe God's calling you to start a, a gathering in your home or in a, wherever, that you can begin this journey of making a safe place that faith can be found in your community. Yeah, and you know, I just want to make sure you understand something else is that we're not in this to make some mega thing, okay? We're just in this, we really want to see safe places in the earth for people to grow and just to learn how to be who they're supposed to be with the sons and daughters of God. You know, and 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 I don't know if you're a pastor, if you're being called to be a pastor. I don't know anybody who is, so you have to know that, Okay. And, but I, what I want to say is don't look at what religion or the organization says and qualifies mm -hmm. a pastor. The first thing is you've got to have that sensing that God is saying something. Um, I want to just tell on you for a minute. He, he's been a pastor. He was been a pastor when, when this thing happened. But, but Henry's still coming out of the traditions that we all have come out of. We used to go to this restaurant after uh, church every Sunday. And they had a manager at this restaurant. And he was tall. And, and I suppose he was handsome. I didn't really pay much attention to that. But, but he carried himself in such a way. And, and Henry goes, man, he'd make a good pastor. And I, every, he'd say this every Sunday. And finally one day I said, why do you say that? Because he just looks the part. Oh, looks the part. Looks the part. Hey, look, I said, are you kidding me? I don't see anything about him that says pastor to me. I'm not drawn to him because he, he has that compassion or that, or that taking care of or, you know, just that thing that a, a true pastor's heart has. And he looked at me and said, really? I said, really? I said, you need to repent. 
And let's but, move on. By the way, that restaurant went bankrupt and doesn't <laughs> exist today. So, yeah. so much what I know. Yeah. yeah. That. But, but he was coming out. So I'm just saying, even if you're in that place where you think, you know, that, that's all the trappings. No, it's got to be deep inside. And, and, and we can help you with that. So this has been some really amazing things to hear this morning. And I want you to know that those of y'all watching, we invited you here to watch, not just to say, you know, this is really neat what they're doing, or I uh, can't wait to see how that happens, but we're, we're including you because we really think that you might be a part of this initiative, a part of ACTS, a part of filling the need of the organism called the Body of Christ here in America and worldwide. So uh, in just a second, we're gonna have Pastor John Shales come up, who is the president of ACTS, and we're gonna ask him some more questions about how maybe you can begin something where you are. Okay, so we have Pastor John Shales here with us. Pastor John is the president of ACT, so we welcome you here. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Um, you've been a pastor here at Hope of the Generations Church for almost 10 years now. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, how that's been going. Very good. Uh, I moved here back in 2000, so that's 18 years at this point, and the first eight year as a sheep and the last 10 as a pastor, as a shepherd. So I really, um, really enjoyed both sides of this. You've grown up. Oh, thank you so much. Under good leadership. So the past couple of, <laughs> the past couple of years, you've really been uh, spearheading this initiative, Acts Association of Churches Teaching and Serving. Uh, you've had your hands all in it. You've been laying a lot of the groundwork and the foundation uh, to really make these, these churches and or gatherings uh, successful. Uh, for generations to come. And so uh, we want to ask you some questions. Uh, maybe give those that are watching a little bit of insight, a little bit of an idea maybe about a little more of the, the vision and what life looks like, uh, possibly as an ex pastor, um, and just, just to get a feel for it. So the first question I have for you is this, what is really the vision of ex churches and gatherings you know, to be placed all around the, the globe in America. What's, what's the vision of these, these churches, you know, locally and together as, as an association? Well, the key words here is to restore and implement the integrity and the authority of the first century church. To restore and implement the integrity and the authority of the first century church. Now, Breaking that all down, uh, to restore really that vision of what are we restoring? That means something like you pull out of a junkyard. You, people love doing this. They love pulling wonderful things, and they, only that person sees the glory of it. But it is a complete mess at that point. And so they know it needs a lot of work. Well, that word restoration has, in our heart, is that we have that in, in our design to go after churches or would-be churches, to pull out of complete loss of really, as we've heard many times before, I think already, the loss of what has happened the last 2,000 years. Why, why did it work in the first century and become where, where it's not as it could be here and now? So we really have a heart to restore it comes right out by Isaiah 42, verse 2, 22, uh, that we say restore to mm -hmm. God's people. And then implement. Well, that's the kind of red tapish stuff that you might be alluding to here. Um, uh, in collaborating and in, in drawing up the, the bylaws of this, we really took weeks and weeks to make sure that this was going to be just straightforward thinking that a church could just hold on to sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's days that in the last days, people will not endure sound doctrine. So we really labored that in our, in our crux of everything that we were going to hold on to and not waver for, uh, waver against, um, that 
the bylaws would be just very sound. And so uh, Dr. Wright and I have collaborated for weeks to make sure that our bylaws were just really airtight. Mm -hmm. And then we had some legal help to help create the articles of incorporation and things like this um, that kind of sum it all up. But it's really in the bylaws that we're that we see that this is what a church can be grounded in. And out of this can come quite, no matter where it is on the globe, you know, a lot of diversity. So it's been really fun to see the vision of those principles, re restoration and the implementation for what? Integrity and power. Mm -hmm. So without the, you know, what I really inspired by just reading the literal the book of Acts, how much dunamis power was given to the early church because it was needed to demonstrate the, their, their message, their voice, their, that they were witnesses of Jesus mm -hmm. and that they could do as ordinary believers the same thing that he did. And more. And wonderfully more. So we, we, what has kind of become a, a cliche or, or made um, just kind of like a, a historical note, we're saying, no, 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 that, that cannot be the crux, uh, uh, just a history lesson. It has to be embedded in church gatherings and in churches themselves that they see that, that God honored with signs and wonders following mm -hmm. what they taught. So this is what's um, really in our heart to preserve in any church that comes underneath the Acts covering. So when you say you talk about restoring and implementing the power and integrity of the first century church. Uh, and so my question then becomes, to what end? To, is it for the restoration of people? Are we restoring that to restore people? What does that look like? What does Scripture say ab about that, you know, in, in, the, in the function of how these gatherings may operate? People make up churches. They make up fellowships that that extend and it should be happening in their homes first. But when you come together in, in a church setting, it's, the scripture is very clear, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Why? Because there's, this is where we learn to live with one another. And so I believe to answer your question, um, what, to what end do we want this power and integrity to come? Obviously so that the Father would be glorified but at the very micro level, not just in esoteric thinking, but in our relationships, mm. in our love for one another, that we really literally can see it um, in, in relationships. Can I add something Yeah, absolutely. There? I really liked how you used the analogy of restoration, like going into maybe um, a junkyard or, or some place that has antiques or something. And, and, and how I see that is that that, that, that piece, whatever it is, it, it's not in its glory days. It's not what it's supposed to be. It's, it's something that's lacking. And it's almost like we, ha as, as believers or ex pastors, if you will, have to be, have the eyes and the mind of God to see what that can become. And, and, That's and vision. yes, yeah. yes, what that can become and how can we help God restore that? So it's not just about one person. It's about mankind. Mm -hmm. Now we know that we're, we know the word speaks of a rem remnant. Okay. So I'm, I'm not as lofty thinking that the whole world is going to, you know, just all be acts churches and we're going to, but one day that will come and that's, it's in a time and in, in, in the new age, which is the millennium, but we're not talking about that. But what I'm saying is that we, we want to do our part to make as healthy as we can those that would say yes to that, that would have the eyes of God to say, that's what, what mankind should look like. That's how we should behave. That's how, that's, that's the normalcy. That's, that's healthy. And that's what we want to do. And we want to create an atmosphere really for that to happen. Uh, just adding to that, the project, uh, the vision of, of Acts is to recover something. Uh, that recovery is to not create something new. I find in Christianity, everybody's looking for some new thing that might work. And there's all kinds of new things that they're being offered to us as believers. We're not advocating something new spectacular. Mm. 
we want to go back to what did work. Right. The old path. And, uh, and uh, the old paths, uh, the, the word says, uh, return to the old paths that you might find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not return. Uh, so then the next thing we do is this, is that, is that the Father is glorified by things that happen in the earth that he makes happen accord with his spirit. And even in, in the statement of Jesus in, a, in Acts 2 and 22, you men of Israel, hear you this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, approved of God amongst you by signs and wonders which God did by him, as you yourself also know. Well, we're sons and daughters. In the new birth, we didn't become Christians first. That's the organization that says we became mm -hmm. Christians. But as an organism, we became sons and daughters. We became restored to our true father, the father of all spirits, because of Jesus. And then we became sons and daughters. So when it says, ye men of Israel, hear this, Jesus of Nazareth, that means Nazareth, Jesus had a zip code. Yep, he sure did. You have a zip code. So it's ordinary men that have a, have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ as the work of the Holy Spirit. So for, the, for this purpose were the sons of God manifest, not just Jesus, that we might destroy the works of the devil. So we're going to bring the kingdom you must be born again. Mm -hmm. But then we must have the power to remove and repair the damage done by the other kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did in the first century. I've always appreciated the simplicity of what you're saying. I know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we sit around, we try to figure out what exactly is going on. And something I did hear you say, it's basically the same thing a long time ago, was, you know, all we do here is we remove one kingdom and establish another. And and that's that's the simplicity of it and that's 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 great. I love that because That was the first century church. Yeah. Well, there's a particular assignment given to the leadership of that first century church. They were given in Ephesians 4, three-part assignment. And if you read in verse 12, it's talking about that these five officers of the elders, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Mm -hmm. They were all called gifts. Not, they weren't the nine gifts. These are the, the five office types within church. That the vision that they were given is found in verse 12. What they were to do is now first perfection, perfecting the saints. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning. Where, that's where they begin. That's they right. begin to care. They begin to, to look after, to comfort, and to call out things that aren't them and to, and to replace and heal and be a, a healing balm to them. But it, it doesn't stop there. Perfecting of the saints then moves into the work of the ministry. You asked earlier, where is this all this going? What's the point of this vision? Now, work of the ministry, typically, I think old school thinking or organized thinking is that just the leadership or particular special people get to do ministry. That's not what this is saying. This is saying who's supposed to be doing the work of the ministry are the saints, not just the eldership of mm -hmm. the church. And this is where it gets exciting, David, because uh, most models have this separation barrier. There's almost like a, a, a brass wall between leadership and, and body life. Mm -hmm. And this does not represent that at all. And that's what Acts churches have, are, are striving to implement is this wonderful base where you have the, the leadership that has a heart for God but is, are ingrained with and, and are equal with the people that they are able to help them do the work of the ministry, not just the, not just the elders. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're tracking? Yeah, tracking. And this is where you get activation. This is where you get a whole body moving and not just a select few. Select few thinking is dangerous. It will quickly go to burnout. It will quickly go to performance. It will quickly go to blah, 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 blah. But if you get a whole body involved, that is what an Acts church is. And lastly, it says, for the body may be edified. And that edification here, this last phase of, of these three parts that uh, these elders are assigned to do, this is where you have the building of not just physical buildings, but a, a spiritual body where it can't, where they won't put up with accusation when things come in. You have a sound structure 
of a whole fellowship when you get everybody working on the same page. And so this is where we see perfection, activation, and edification just given to the elders, but it's really for the whole body. Mm. Wow, that's excellent. That's mm-hmm. great. That, that's um, exactly it. <laughs> yeah. The, Go ask churches. Yeah. The, you can do this. Yeah. The body of Christ is uh, not what it could be. We have the head. Mm-hmm. We hope he does everything for us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's, that's the men- true. That's, that's it. the mentality. Yep. When in fact the head oversees from heaven as a work of the Holy Spirit according to the will of the Father what the body should be doing in the earth. And it is very clear that God thinks of us corporately as if we were a human body. Mm-hmm. And we're fitly joined together, we're supplying, we're taking care of each other. And even in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, I don't know if I'm premature in talking about this, but we're here. Yeah, go for it. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is the apostle of the New Testament church age. So we go back and look at the inspiration that God gave him, and we follow it as a mandate. And uh, we have to follow it as God's mandate. And even in the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, found in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, we, we look at all the gifts, we look at the work of the Father and the, and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in the body, but then in verse 11 it says, but these, but all these works, that's talking about all these nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, all these works that one and the self-same Spirit, the one Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally or individually as he will. Mm-hmm. So then we come into the corporate setting. Now we come into the assembly. Now we come into body parts getting together, which is what, what a gathering is. That's what a church service is. All over the world, in part, in pieces, when we get together here at Hope of the Generations Church, it's body parts. Now, I don't mean to offend you, but that's what the Bible refers to us as. And these body parts come together to edify each other, to, to, to be an extension of the mind of God. And, and even in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, now you are the body of Christ. This has to be apprehended because the first century church looked at each member as a functioning part of that body. Well, and, and, and it breaks it down here. Paul says now, and God has set. Now, who, who sets this in the church? God. God. Men do. No. Not organization. God, by his spirit, the Holy Spirit, we read it in verse 11, mm-hmm. dividing severally, individually, to whoever he will, to those that make themselves available, you must desire the best gift for you, according to Scripture, in the gifts, desire the best gift that you think you could serve with. And, but then God has set some of the church first, apostles, secondly, prophets. That's part of the fivefold eldership that John referred to there in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, and thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles. Now, the first century church had miracles. This is a fading reality in the organized religion, religious churches of the day around the world. In fact, I don't mean to offend anyone, but in fact, Probably over 80% of Christian churches in the world teach that healing passed away 2,000 years ago with the apostles. Mm -hmm. There is not one scripture to prove that, quite the opposite. And I function as a New Testament believer, and I promise you, I promise you, it is, I'm not bragging, I'm not making anything up. My record, my journey speaks of itself. How the Father, in Jesus' name, as a work of the Holy Spirit, has done things at my hands that you can read in the book of Acts. Every single thing. Because Jesus said, the things that I do, you shall do. So if Jesus is the head and we're in the body, Jesus said, body, get up and go, go do it in my name. That is the teachings of Paul. Get up, go do it in my name that the Father may be glorified. So then we have miracles, we have gifts of healings. Then here comes helps. Well, this is how the the body cares for itself in ordinary, everyday things. The ministry of helps. Then governments and diversities of tongues. Is everyone a prophet? Is everyone an apostle? Is everyone a worker of miracles? Or do I have to get to healing? No. But somebody should. So the Acts gatherings of churches or gatherings, we wish to make this thing work as it was designed to work. And, and to settle for less 
is not God's will. And in these last days, will there be faith found in the earth? Now, we can have a form of godliness, and we can say, yea, Lord, and we can even teach, repent and be baptized. But if we deny the power of a living God for today, I'll tell you what the Bible says. Those that say, yea, Lord, yes, Lord, but deny the power, you must turn away from these. Mm -hmm. Because to preach a gospel of a living, powerful God that can do nothing today is heresy. And I don't, I don't ascribe to it. Here's what's amazing about, I think, what we're hearing. And, and for those of you watching, I, I want you to really think about what I'm about to say. Is So far, here's what I've heard. I've heard um, about five different offices of, of elders. I've heard about nine different gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've heard about diversities and in inspiration of how God wants to work with the body to feed into a flow of a service. There's all these moving parts to it. And what I'm, what I'm thinking about in, in my mind is that's impossible to organize. Perfect. However, however, it works when you have a head. That's right. It does. Okay, the, again, the body's not going to work. Our body's not going to work unless we got a brain, you know. So it's got a head, and that's, that's why it all works. So it's just, it's, it's exciting, and it's, it, to look at Scripture, it's almost as if God designed this, that if it was to work right, it's impossible to organize, but it works perfectly because it's got a Say head. It again. Say it again. Ex ex excellent, excellent what you're saying because Jesus, the head, yeah. said this, the things that I do, you shall do, and greater things than I do, you shall do because I go to the Father. Why? That the Holy Spirit could be sent to work with us like he worked with Jesus and the apostles and all the church. To say that we're the body of Christ but we don't follow the head, what kind of body are we? Mm-hmm. What I'm saying in the world today, we need a functioning, spirit-filled, live organism that's serving the living Father in Jesus' name, bringing in the kingdom of salvation, and then destroying the works of the devil, which is our calling, so that mankind's condition can improve, the Father can get the glory, and what is wrong with that? That's a great vision. So, now here's the thing. The head, Jesus, right. going back to heaven. Right. He's at the right hand of the Father. He said they sent the Holy Spirit yeah. to men. Sorry, with the apostles, first century church. Um, and today, it is still entrusted to men as under shepherds or under bishops of, of that head that went back to heaven. So, you know, there might be people thinking about, well, could that be me? Is that is that something that... God might be calling me to do. How would I go about doing it? What, what does Acts offer the ordinary believer out there that might be sensing something that's going on that they could kind of get started and, and have somebody helping them along the way? Well, we have 35-ish years of experience of going through all seasons, I think, of church growth and um and that's just between living through things uh, and then also being a resource for other churches even before Acts has been formed and individuals asking, what should we do with in our church? We're having this situation. So I think God has really entrusted a lot of understanding, uh, knowledge and understanding that has produced a lot of wisdom for fellowships to glean from. And so we... We have behind the scenes um, constructed an interactive form. And for those that, you know, that you're, you're with being health, if you've been on the Overcomers community, there is a segment just for, uh, just for the ACTS participants that, are, that would be behind this. This would be available to them. And it's interactive. It's a way of engaging. There's, um, there are things that we really see that are specific teachings that are patterned and based in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. That will that would really help a church, no matter where they're at, no matter what the background is, to implement something that is spiritual and not just try to create a, a cookie cutter of something else. I have a really interesting radical thought. Let's hear it. And it's radical. <laughs> the way I see it, organized religion today, called Christianity in some parts, is a headless organiz organization not organism. It's headless. 
It says it's a body of Christ, but it doesn't follow the head. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do what the head told us to do. So our job, and I think my calling in part, is to give Jesus his body back. So the head and the body can become one in thought, in speech, in application, and deed. Not headless or bodiless. This really is our goal, is to let God be glorified in the total organism of what he created. We're being, we're being trained to be kings and priests in the millennium. We better start learning soon. Somewhere. It's Somewhere. Be on Mars. Else, what are we going to teach these natural people to rule over in the millennium? What have we got to offer? The Lord is the head will not continue with status quo from this age. Go ahead. So you asked, what are some of the things that we would do? We, um, you know, we really need to understand this word ordination. To, to really drill down into it, it really means, um, you know, the, the calling out and the selection. And really only that person that is, is hearing, possibly, what is this that I'm hearing? And what, is there anything of the Spirit of God drawing me to be called out to serve him in one of these offices? of an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We're pretty much talking with about pastors mm -hmm. right here and now. But if you select that or, or understand that there is a, a calling, an unction, uh, that you know that you've been um, preconditioned by God to um, be a pastor, this is where we would like to discuss this with you. I think just knowing that you could have a place to converse some, with us about some of these unctions that you're having, I mean, th that is a big deal in itself because the traditional model is, um, I feel called, I better go to seminary. Mm -hmm. I better go and I better get a block of t you know, my life into teaching and studying you know, and understanding teachings. But we don't see that in, in the first century church. They hung out with Jesus, but they lived life with him. And then really, they really didn't remember a whole lot of things until after he left, and the Holy Spirit brought remembrance to them. So really, they couldn't rely on physically having Jesus anymore. So this calling out is, we want to be a part where, an offer to you, uh, this extension of conversation. What, what is this that I'm feeling? What is, is it really an, an ordination that I'm being called into? So that is another thing that we would like to offer for those that may be considering, you know, is this something that I'm, I'm supposed to be doing in my local community? But maybe something that um, y'all could speak into a little bit, because it, like you said, traditionally, the mindset would be, I'm going to go get an education at, a, at some sort of institution or some, you know, I, somewhere, okay? Online. Online, something like that. But you don't hear a lot about, and this is really a, a, a worldly term, but I think it fits well into uh, how, how we grow up into these things, is on-the-job training. You know, what does that look like in the life of a, of a pastor? I think a lot of times we want it to be nice and buttoned up. We go, we get totally prepared in some institution, then we know everything when we go out. So we won't fail at anything, right? <laughs> I'd like to speak into that. Uh, Jesus uh, chose his staff. 12, uh, and uh, none of those would have passed the first stage of an interview in any, most churches in the world today. They didn't qualify. None of them had a degree. One was a fisherman. And they all stunk like fish, right? And they, <laughs> they all, they were, they were just ordinary people that Jesus chose. Said, and what he said is, follow me. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Then they had three and a half years of on-the-job training. And it was in the trenches. And uh, then later, uh, the Bible says that the learned ones of the uh, organized church of the day, which was the Old Testament church, the Jews, uh, they watched this group going up and down Israel, preaching as a gospel, healing the sick, doing cures, casting out devils, raising the dead. They watched these guys coming and going, doing these incredible things in the name of Jesus. And they scratched their head. And this is very important to you listening because you may be intimidated by learned people. Listen, you've got to let that one go. There isn't a seminary in the world that has produced a revival in the past 200 years. So what is the purpose? 
I'm just asking the question. There may be others that are, would be cranking out people that are New Testament believers. I'm there, I know you're there, so don't think I'm stereotyping this whole thing. But you have to understand what these religious leaders said. They said, we perceive that these are ignorant and unlearned men that are turning the world upside down. It didn't make any sense to them. Because these men were being led not just by the Word of God, not just by the teachings of Jesus, but by the Spirit of God. Because it is a Father that does everything by His Holy Spirit, in our case, in the name of Jesus. So the issue is this, is that the process of having a drawing of the Holy Spirit. First of all, you can't even get born again unless the Spirit of God draws you. The Bible says so. No one comes to God. So if you're here and you're looking around at organized religion and you're intimidated by the, those that have degrees, I, there was a denomination here in Georgia a few years ago, it was in the Times uh, Union or whatever it is up in Atlanta, and, and it said, unless you have a doctorate, you're not qualified to be a pastor. You will not find that in Scripture anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I want to release you from that stigma. I want to release you from that fear of man's observation of you. And I want you to listen deeply in your heart. Is God calling you to oversee one of his precious flocks? Wow. It's good stuff. And you know, I, I know that in decision making, uh, you know, as as if this if this would be something that God has called them to, there's there's definitely the the component of hearing from God, uh, but there's also the component of just sometimes logistical questions as well. And so I just want to um, ask y'all some logistical questions about um, Acts, okay, and and what a uh, potential pastor of a small little gathering or church. Uh, might be asking themselves, okay? So, uh, let's see here. Pastor Henry, my first question is for you, okay? You may have already answered this in part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and ask it anyway. Does someone have to have prior experience in pastoring or in church leadership to begin an Acts gathering? Uh, no, you don't have to have any experience at all. The good news about Acts is that you become linked immediately with those who do have experience and many years of experience in, in pastoring and taking care of flocks. So if you take the theme on the job training, you begin where you're at. And Jesus chose men that were right where they were at. Uh, and little David, the, the shepherd boy taking care of the sheep, did not realize he was called to be king of Israel. No inkling. Mm-hmm. But because he was faithful in taking care of sheep and laying his life down, and he, he, it qualified him, if he'd be that careful about animals, how much more he'd be that much careful about humans? Mm. So the issue is, is, is the calling of God is greater than the experience. Because if you're going by experience, I'm going to say this just while I'm hearing it. If you go by experience, you're going to follow what already is. You're going to follow what others are teaching as the model for the kingdom. I've been around a while, and I've traveled extensively, and I have to tell you, Christianity is not working as a true model of what is taught in the book of Acts. So what do I do with that? So what I'm having to say to you, that if you're going by experience, you're going by the experience, we say, well, if we, if we come in with Acts, we're going by your experience. Yes, it's a foundation for you to learn from. And that's certainly important to you, that you're not alone in this, so you don't you know, come up with an idea that's not scriptural. But we're not trying to, and this is very important, we're not trying to form you out of our experience. We're trying to release you out of our experience. Mm -hmm. Release is the key word. Key word. Release you out of our experience to do things that maybe we're not even doing. And that would be really powerful to mm -hmm. see that happen. Can I do just well, a little yeah. tag right there? Yeah. You know, David was chosen because he was a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. God's really looking for someone who has that heart because he can do anything with that heart. Okay. So that's really who he's looking for. Very good. And Pastor Donna, this next question is actually for you. You know, I, again, going, kind of going along with uh, 
mainline organized, you know, religion thinking, we typically think about a building, and it, we have a building. You know, Hope of Generations has a building, so it's not a negative thing <laughs> whatsoever. But but to somebody that's considering uh, beginning uh, an axe church or, or fellowship, do they need to be thinking about how to get a building? No, they don't, actually. In fact, you know, I mean, if they have one, that's one thing. Like mm-hmm. you said, like there could be a, a, an already um, working church that's interested even in what we're saying. But just for the ordinary believer that's going, I think that's me, they can start in the living room. They can start just having for having some people over, um, some teaching, some you know praying for one another. No, they do not have to go out and think about the expense of what that looks like. Um, later on, when the gather the gathering might grow, yes, you 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 may think, oh gosh, we just we just uh, outgrew something, and then you can think later about what that would look like. But no, to start with, you can just start right where you're at, you're at in your home or someone else's gift. They have a bigger home, whatever they want to do. No, you don't have to be concerned about that. So, Pastor John, next question is for you. Thank you, Pastor Donna. Um, so a lot of times, you know, when people, uh, again, uh, we, we have ideas of what something should or shouldn't look like that may or may not always be accurate. And some people considering out there uh, this opportunity uh, may be right in the middle of a career or, you know, they have a, they have a job. I mean, they go to every day that you know, has something to do with church life or ministry or anything. Um, does that person that would start an, an Acts Fellowship, that potential pastors, they need to quit their current job or career. So we're also t- talking twofold to existing churches that may want to participate with the Axe Association mm-hmm. or those, and your question is more directed towards those that would like to begin one. And so obviously if you're already a pastor, don't quit your day job <laughs> or your <laughs> yeah, night job. You it's, it's the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, I think you, so I just wanted to clarify that um, we do uh, t- talk with existing churches that would like to, assi- you know, be aligned with and be a part of the association. So that's I'm going to set that aside. And for those that have to, for a season, participate in the workforce, and uh, please don't quit your day job because this thing is that's trying and this moving it you, how can you move a titanic just by spinning the wheel no this thing takes time to reshift what you're and how it works out day to day and and so finances are a very spiritual thing and you talk to your provider about in heaven about what all that looks like but you don't quit your job because you can, when you have, and you know that God is calling you, you will not let go of that calling, and you will see that there is a phasing, this, this phasing of responsibilities, and how God is then, now, what you say, hey, I'm going to give my life to, to, to extend the kingdom as an elder. You watch how God will provide, and be amazed on, on how he does it. So, but that interim, that time when you you're already working, I want to tell you, don't let that be something you have to disdain and get in and feel like finally I can get out of this job. That that's not what Axe is for. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. You, you this that the the job that you have right now is actually a trying of your heart and how you will be a pastor before you're even at over a church flock because really it's a man's gifts will make room for him. It's really an awesome testing place to see what's in your heart prior to actually being in that full office. That's, that's a great answer. You know, yeah, I would do yeah. because, because um, Henry, he, he worked for many years in just a secular field and was, was a, you know, a pastor, and we took the calls at night. And I mean, and, and, and I'm going to say it wasn't easy, but, but he did it. Mm-hmm. And then there was this one day when... He said, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to now just not work a secular job. But it came, it came down at a time where I wouldn't be a burden to the right. flock that, ha- that had been developing. Yeah. So even, even that first three years of pastoring a church, I didn't take any money. Right. I worked. Yes. I but freelanced. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But, but when it came time where the flock was large enough to be able to, and, and the amount, the amount of, of salary that I initially took for the next three years would make most of you laugh. Yeah. 
I won't tell you what it is, but with a family of eight, you would be amazed. But we did, we did just, just fine. But it we did just fine. It was a great adventure. It was and, a great and adventure. And it wasn't a hardship no, it was because a hardship. Our, it was our heart. Yeah. And God met us. Yeah. Well, I, I love the perspective that was brought about from all three of you on that, that question. And I know that clarifies it a lot for those that are watching. Pastor Henry, this next question is for you. As a, as a pastor, do you have to be a good public speaker? <laughs> and do you have to know a lot of the Bible? <laughs> well... I told somebody the day they asked me that, I said, well, find you an Aaron. That really should have been my question, really. <laughs> find you a what? Find Aaron. you an Aaron. An Aaron. An Aaron. Yeah, Moses couldn't speak for himself, so only Aaron. A-A-R-O-N. Yeah. Yeah, fine. yeah. And uh, I, I don't, Paul said he was not of eloquent speech. Right. He said that out of himself. And uh, so I think sometimes we think truth has to be vocalized in a very professional way to be understood. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit <clears throat> honors truth at whatever way it's presented, if there's a heart open to receive what is said. And as people are looking for a public speaker that's perfect, your heart's not really open to the truth, you're open to the atmosphere. And that's just an opinion. And uh, I'm sure I won't quote. No, you don't <laughs> have to be a great speaker. And uh, there was a second part of this question. Do you have to know a lot of the Bible? Well, I tell you, I've been pastoring uh, for over three decades, three and a half decades, and I still know the whole, don't know the whole Bible thoroughly. But I study it continually, and I can learn every day. I learn more. And so I began somewhere. And so when I had people ask me questions, because early on in taking care of people, I wouldn't make up answers. I'd say, let me, let me see if I can find a scripture that can answer that. Mm -hmm. And I'll get back to you. And you know, in that process, I learned from the word that became part of the collection of wisdom that I operate in today. So you have to start somewhere. And, and I know sometimes you're intimidated by who you see on TV and who you see on the radio and you go to your churches and stuff. Listen, that has nothing to do with you. You have to follow God's call in your life no matter what. Or else you're going to be miserable. Mm. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> yeah, Moses. So, so if, I, if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is, you know, it's not about how well you can speak or how much you know. It's, it's your heart of them. It's the heart of them. You know, I have to tell you something. We, I, we raised some kids, and sometimes my Donna would think I would be speaking over the heads of my kids, and I probably was. You were. And so this is, how, this is how it works. So sometimes I would say something, and, and Donna would hear me say it, and she knew the kids didn't understand the thing I was saying. And she would say, now, now kids, this is what he really means. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he's really... So I she, bring it down to the level of their understanding. The, yes, and, yes and, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and it's, and it's so wonderful to think about that. I wasn't, I wasn't upset. Yeah. It was true. <laughs> and so, sometimes we have a lot of people around us that can help us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, you know, the first thing you do when you don't understand a person is, uh, and I do that in marriage. You know, the, the, I, you know that I know the, the root behind misunderstandings. Somebody just didn't understand. And that's as simple as that. So sometimes in, in, in a marriage, you know, you, you <laughs> have these moments in the relationship and and I've learned something to do something. See, you can do this with any leader, spiritual leader, even if he says it wrong, or if he says it backwards, or upside down. You go to him and say, now, would you explain to me what you meant? And I would, I would say, Donna, would you, in my relationship with her, I'd say, would you say that again so I can process it? That's my big one. I, I need to process this. Now, this is part of communication. Mm -hmm. it, and it's not sterile. It's a living relationship that we would go in. And look at the disciples. Do you think the disciples of Jesus really understood what he was talking about? They, no, they said they didn't. They said they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so what you, what? But they became apostles. There's hope for you. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, I want to just tack on to that. Yeah, tag on. I do, because, you know, um, for myself, my journey, with, especially with the second part of this question, is that I just shared from what I knew. I shared from what I knew was in the Word, 
and how it applied to whatever, you know, just to daily life. I shared from that. But as I was sharing from what I already had ingested, if you would, it led me to want to know more about mm-hmm. it. So it's like the more you give out, the more you want. So it's kind of like the more you give, the more you go look and seek. And so I think it's, I think because I'm going to tell you, just like you said, I don't know the whole Bible. I think the, what's the most important thing is that you actually understand the heart of God. That's the thing. When you read the scriptures, it's not about, can I quote this? You know, where can I put this? It's more about what is the heart of God saying? Because that's what the, all the scriptures is about. It's his heart to mankind. And, and, how, and how can I convey that? And I think with that, then God just starts to really snowball your understanding of scripture. Yeah, it's true. And besides, the more times you're asked something you don't have an answer to is a powerful part of your learning curve. Mm-hmm. Because you don't go to malpractice and give somebody a false answer. You say, I don't know. But I'll go, I'll go study on that. And there becomes your journey of growing up. So that, that digging into the Word is part of the on-the-job training. You know, I, I know. You yeah. It's got to be. It's got to be. Like mm-hmm. the first time when I was pastoring my first pastorate, and a young lady brought her husband. We were having a prayer meeting, and she parked out where I had a storefront church. You know, that's where we could meet. And uh, she parked the car outside, and she came running in about her husband was on the floorboard of the car, all in involuntary muscle spasm. And she says, take an emergency, but I figured the church is closer. Why don't you try that first? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. The, the, the hospital was 15 miles away, and the church was a mile. So she gave God a chance first. So she said, smart. And so smart. I went out, here's her husband, an involuntary muscle spasm in the floorboard of the car. What am I supposed to do? I don't know much those days. And so I don't know nothing. But, but I, I remember saying something. I already had compassion for her. So I had a little bit of training in biology in my time. And so I knew there was all kinds of things going with muscle spasms. So I commanded the hypothalamus to stop taking messages of fear and to calm down and the spirit of fear to be gone in Jesus' name. And just like that, he was calm. Later, oh, she was happy. Her husband was well. Me, I don't know what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know what I did? OJT. This is on-the-job training. <laughs> what I did, I, I had my old textbook from college days, anatomy and physiology. I'd heard about the hypothalamus. I know a lot about it today. But I didn't then, except I learned about it mm-hmm. in school. So I got my textbook up from college and began to look at the hypothalamus and how it functions. And that has become the foundation of a large part of our ministry, coming from an ignorant floorboard experience with a sheep. <laughs> That's how you grow up. I think you can do this. Yeah, I, th- I, think, <laughs> I think you can do this. Now I'm considered an expert in the field. <laughs> Are you serious? How did I get here? <laughs> That's a great story. That's good. That's great. Well, Pastor Don, I got a question for you. Okay. This one's a a, a little bit of a tougher one, just because there's some explaining to do with it. Got some Um, explaining to do. Got some explaining to do. Okay. Uh, Maybe somebody's got a question, because many people watching this have probably been to um, our For My Life program here. Okay. um, Or some other kind of program um, here. And, you know, they might be thinking, well, you know, I love what I heard. I love what you teach and all that. And, and can, can I just maybe have a little gathering in my home and, and, and teach those, you know, foundational principles, but still just, you know, go to my regular church on uh, Sunday mm-hmm. and, or Wednesday or whenever, whenever they go and, and just have this little kind of group on the side that teaches what I learned at a program with you guys? The answer is no. That's not what this is about, Okay. The what you learn at a For My Life program or even a conference, mm-hmm. you know, or any other program that you might attend for, that we that we um, uh, are doing is 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 our outreach to help the body of Christ. That's just our outreach. But that is not what we're talking about. That's not that's that's not going to that's not going to go anywhere. OK, that's just going to be really you're not doing church. You're just doing um, ministry moments is kind of what I call it. It's like, no, th- that's not what we're talking about. Now, will some of what we teach kind of bleed through a bit? Yeah, of course. I mean, bitterness is still bitterness and unforgiveness is still unforgiveness and, needs and fear. To be there. And yeah, but, but it's not about teaching a for my life program to a bunch of people in whatever segmented form. No, this is about what a church really does. 
like Mary, you know, Barry, um, you know, uh, baby dedication, baptize, mm-hmm. um, all the things that you would do in a normal function. Yeah. You know, um, have baby showers, body life. It's about body life. And so, no, it's, it's not about doing a being health conference. It's not doing about a for my life. That is not what we're asking. We're asking for you not to do that. Actually, we're asking you to become the body of Christ in your local reality, wherever you live to do the works of the ministry within the confines of your local church. And, you know, whatever you do for your community later as because you're a church, that's different, you know, that's different for everybody, but no, we're not asking them to teach a for my life program at all. You know, I'd like to speak into that also is as I see, uh, a axe gathering or church. Jesus is very clear, go into the whole world, make disciples out of all men. He didn't say get them healed first or get them delivered. Because healing and deliverance comes after discipleship. There has to be principles of the kingdom that you embrace, and that's what works. Mm -hmm. So part part of taking care of a flock is teaching them the word of God. One of the things that we're suggesting uh, to those uh, new churches that are or gatherings that are being formed uh, is what do I teach? Where do I start? I've had this question asked. Where do I start? What do I teach? Do I start in Genesis? Uh, do I start in Revelation? Do I do one week? Or what we're suggesting, and I think this is a good place to learn how to care biblically for a flock, even if you're starting a new one, is, and we have it on DVD. Mm-hmm. You, you did it in your home. Yeah, I did. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, as and and out of that, you became a deacon, and then you moved into the office of uh, teaching elders. So mm-hmm. you've progressed yourself in this journey. Mm-hmm. But way back in your faithfulness, you would invite people to your home and watch the teaching, His Ways versus Our Ways. Mm-hmm. And you broke it down into 14 weeks. And you took a little segment, you played it, and then you discussed it. Then you had fellowship. That's all we did. And that's all you did for 14 weeks. Mm-hmm. This is a format that would work in somebody that has stage fright starting, is get the teaching. We have it broken down. You still have it broken yeah, down. Yeah, it's, it's, each, it's, yeah. it's and, already broken and, down for you. Hey, listen, your first three months is already cared for. I mean, that's how you get out of it. <laughs> this is how you jump out of the chute fast, <laughs> is, is just play to your gathering or even to your church. Uh, that segment of his ways versus our ways. Because that sets the stage for who you are as a pastor, helping your people go into discerning are my ways, his ways. And, and this is critical. Mm-hmm. And that way we have the tools of living and life. And so it becomes a life application process. How do I think? How do I speak? How do I act? In with my family, in the church, in the marketplace. So this is a powerful place to begin and the menu is for you, for you, and then by that time, you should be out of your stage fright. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that, you know, we have two services a week, and we never run a For My Life program in any one of those services. Never. Okay? It's not about that. If, if that's all that you're really after, that is just so lopsided. And, I mean, you're not going to be a normal body if that's all you're ever centering on. There's so much more than all that we teach in the For My Life. So just... Just kind of take that off the shelf. And, you know, you brought up his ways versus our ways. And earlier when you were talking about, um, you know, a headless church, you know, I was thinking, I was like, you know, how do you get back to that? I was thinking his ways versus our ways. That's how you oh, that's good, get, David. get the head back, you know, on the body of Christ. So it would be an excellent place to start for you know, sure. I, I think that was something, an inspiration. I had to be Holy Spirit brought that to me is to see, do we have a headless body? Do we have a, a head with no body? And they have a body with no head. Mm-hmm. I think God really wanted to say that in this conversation. I do too. Okay, I got one last question that is for you, Pastor John. Um, so let's say, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, there's going to be kind of an assessment process. A conversation gets going um, where people can bounce questions, you know, back and forth and, and kind of work through some of this through conversation. What if they get started with that process and just decide it's not for them. I mean, is, what, what, what happens? Well, um, I know the devil loves to pick off anybody. So we want to first um, go after the devil <laughs> and to make sure that he's not messing with you. 
because we really believe that um, not only a man's gifts will make room for him and all that it takes for someone to realize that there's a calling there. And, but we also see that, um, that once you're an elder, you're, you're stuck. That's, in a good way. Yeah, in a very good <laughs> way. Um, because um, those gifts and callings are without repentance, Scripture says. And so we'd want to have a, a real open communication to make sure that something hasn't gotten in somewhere in your in trying to interfere with what God has in in His heart for you and through you. Uh, there's things that got into Moses, and we lost him for a number of years before he got you know pulled out of the backside of the desert. Mm-hmm. So I know that there's a a realistic place that um, the individuals may be tempted by things and drawn away. And iniquity is such a huge component. And and if you don't have a sounding board for some of this stuff, it's so easy to get chewed up by your generational stuff or fear of failure or whatever it is. And it it just can't be the end of the conversation just because you don't want to do it anymore. I have something to interject for those of you that are considering this conversation. Peter's another example. Yeah, exactly. Um, When you become part of the association... We provide ordination. Now that ordination ties us to you for your success and your growth and to your calling. So it's, it's not that you say, well, I've, I've signed up now. I don't really think I'm called. Well, I'd have to, we'd really want to talk to you about what, what ignited you to begin with. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and John, you're right. The enemy comes to interfere. Uh, to change, to, to circumstances. Uh, even Paul said, uh, uh, I'd have come to you sooner, but Satan has resisted me. So he had circumstances that kept him from even following his heart for another fellowship. And so there's a battle for our lives. But I want to tell you that the ordination means that we undergird and come underneath you in Jesus' name to make sure that you can grow into your calling, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the interference. And I just wanted to throw that in, that that is yours if you become part of the association. That's really good. Thank you all so much for answering those questions. I know it's helped them watching and those that are considering becoming an Acts pastor a whole lot. And so here's what we're going to do next. Next, we are actually going to uh, show you a testimony and actually, it's more of a, a, a story of a journey of Granville and Janice Lamb, who are Acts pastors. They have a church in Presque Isle, Maine called New Song Church. And they're going to share with you a little bit about their journey from just, you know, being a sheep, getting healed, getting delivered, and then growing up into pastoring a flock. I'd like to say hi to everybody out there today. Uh, We are, to give you a little bit of a background of who we are, uh, introduce myself to you. My name is Granville Lamb, Jr., and this is my wife, Janice Lamb. Uh, We're co-pastors of New Song Church uh, in Easton, Maine. uh, We're just outside of Presque Isle, Maine, way up in the northern part of the state of Maine. And we're going to have an opportunity to be able to share our journey with you, uh, give you our testimony as to what has God done in our lives to bring us to where we're at today. And we just uh, want to thank the Hope of the Generation Church and Dr. Wright and Pastor Donna for this opportunity to be able to share with you. And I know that many of you out there may have a journey of your own or testimony, and you may say, well, I know God wants to work in me, but what, what will that be? What's that going to look like? Or uh, where am I supposed to do? And I believe that if you listen to what we have today, to share what we've got in our testimony, it may help you to understand better where you're at uh, with what you're trying to do. And uh, just want to say thank you again, and we'll just uh, be able to share with you. Like my husband said a few minutes ago, we have a journey that we want to share with you. Our journey actually starts when we're born, but I want to start when I'm uh, a little bit older, a young girl and a teenager. My heart's desire always was to just be a mom and a wife, 
and I had no desire to be a career person, whatever. And as we got married and I had uh, our first child, Ken, at age 23, and our daughter, Julie, at age 25, things were going good in our life up to that point, but when I was pregnant for my daughter, Julie, uh, things began to happen in my body. Uh, uh, diseases began to set in, syndromes. I fell and fractured my ankle while I was carrying her at six months. That caused issues after the uh, birth, her birth. I had a lot of autoimmune diseases begin to start, like sarcoidosis, interstitial cystitis, lichen sclerosis, fibromyalgia. I just had a lot of sickness in my life. I felt like uh, the devil himself was right after me. Uh, and I had those sicknesses that I dealt with, and some of them very painful um, situations, right up until I was 54 years old. I was miraculously healed by God of fibromyalgia, and my immune system was uh, miraculously restored to its full function. But not only me, but our daughter as well. And when that happened, it really opened our eyes that there's more to the God we've been worshiping and serving for 30 some odd years that we didn't really know about. It was just uh, a very uh, powerful thing in our life and an eye opener that there's more. And so we began the journey of searching for more. The more of God that we knew was there because we had experienced it in such a miraculous way. It, a few years after that healing, our daughter, Julie, gave us the book, A More Excellent Way, and we began to read it. And as we read it, we could see that there were portions of scripture that we really weren't aware of in the Bible, that we kind of were stuck in a denominational box that taught just certain things. But our eyes were open to the full gospel of Jesus Christ in this book, and that I had hope because I had other things besides the fibromyalgia that I was dealing with, so it gave me hope that I could be healed of other things. <clears throat> and so we continued on that journey and went to hear uh, then Pastor Wright speak in Sarasota and then went to some of his programs in Georgia. And we just, we it was like being born again again with all the fullness of the gospel that we were receiving. And so that journey included more healing uh, as well as deliverance. And so we came home with uh, excitement. We came home with a desire to share with other people what we were learning because there are a lot of hurting and sick people in our world. And my husband and I have a desire to help people especially when we've got the truth that we'd like to share with people, and, uh, and we have a heart for God. So God began to um, work in our lives, changing the direction uh, of where we would even be in church and what we'd be doing. We didn't have a plan to be pastors. We just were following God's lead, just step by step. And uh, I think that my husband will pick up from here and just help you to understand how we got to where we are right now. Well, you heard Janice's testimony in regards to the health issues that she had going on in her life. And I can say as a husband, to be able to watch your wife suffer and, and you don't have the answers. And knowing that you call out to God and ask him to help. And, and we've always had a heart for God and people and trying to uh, witness to them or show them uh, who the, the Father in Heaven is. And we've been in the church for 30, 35 years, and uh, we weren't just uh, pew warmers, but we were actually people who uh, were involved with every part of the church that you can think of, whether it's uh, cleaning the, the bathrooms or whether it was teaching children all the way up to adults to small group ministries to being on the board for many years, treasure. There's many different aspects of what we were, uh, we were at. And all of a sudden, realizing that a healing that took place when she, uh, with the fibromyalgia, she was, her back 
uh, her shoulders. She couldn't even lift her arms uh, to a situation where the muscles on her back was just as hard as a table uh, if you was to touch a table. And, uh, and it made it very difficult to be able to, to watch that and be able to see the healing take place miraculously. And then you realize there's a whole lot more that God has for us. And that's where it started us on a journey, as, as Janice has said. And we started looking and reading and understanding more and applying what we were reading and understanding. And I can remember God gave me a vision, and maybe God's given you a vision out there. And you may have say something, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And I didn't know what to do with it at the time. But God gave me a vision. I can remember it very vividly. It was almost in color that it was like a, a knoll. I don't call it a hill. It was just a knoll. And I was... I can remember saying, what do we do with all this information, Lord? And he just gave me this vision of people coming over a knoll. And it was just like it was one or two people singly. And then all of a sudden it was a, a, a woman coming with her child in her arms, a husband and a wife, and the child walking and holding on the hand. And over the knoll, people just kept coming. And the more they kept coming, the fuller the hill came with more people. And we're just like, what do we do with all these people? And I believe it's the knowledge of God and the vision he gave, and we're seeing that happen in our church today, is that vision is coming true. And we didn't know what to do with that. And we sat on that for a short period of time. I believe God was showing us. But we decided that God was calling us out, and then we decided to... Um, change where we were at, where we were at in, in church. It was a mainline uh, denomination. Um, they were having a hard time. That's where some of the works that was being done was actually showing up and didn't want to receive that. And so we were meeting in our living room, and we just people, we never asked anybody. The people said, where have you been? We haven't seen you lately. And they said, well, we're having church in our living room. We, we did try a few churches and then couldn't find anything that uh, would even line up with what we thought was uh, correct. We started in our living room, and it was just the two of us, and then went to three, and it just kept growing and growing, and people kept coming. And it got to a point where either I was going to have to build a new living room, make it larger, or I was going to have to uh, see what we did to uh, change that. So we end up renting... Um, a, at a community center, and uh, and at that particular time in the living room, we in that process, um, I got ordained uh, through Hope of the Generation Church, um, and at that particular time, we decided we needed to to start the church, and we did that. And it's kind of interesting because the day that I was ordained, when we look back in history, mm -hmm. it was exactly four days to the day that she was healed. Four years. Four years. Four years. I'm sorry. Four years. There was that from the time that I uh, that she was healed, that I was ordained, and I wasn't pre-planned. It just happened to be the way it was, and it's kind of interesting to see the, the relationship between the dates. We end up going to a community center for a little over three years. We rented uh, a place. It was very inexpensive, but the reality was when we started our church, we had no money. And I've made a commitment that we wouldn't go in debt. And we were just gathering our, uh, the offerings and our, uh, the givings were coming in, and we bought uh, equipment as we could afford it. And we rented in a center for over three years. And we'd go there. We'd have to tear down the tables and chairs that were there, set them up for us, set up all of our equipment. And then at the end of the, day, the service, we would turn around and um, put everything back in place, and load everything back up uh, and be able to take it home and put it away again in the closet. So we did that for over three years. And it was a, uh, I gotta say, I gotta commend the people that we had with us. Um, we couldn't have done it alone. It was our flock that is uh, with us and supported us and been with us. And uh, at that period of time, we've also, at the end of that time, we had an opportunity to go to a church that uh, a school was going to be built. Uh, for a Christian school, and it was a, an old church <clears throat> building. 
And we went there and we rented there for a little over a year, about a year and a half. And uh, when, when the school was built, then they needed the, the building. Uh, so we ended up moving to another church, uh, but we went to a Saturday night service. <clears throat> we coexisted with them, and we did that for about a year. But we found that Saturday night was not uh, conducive for us. Also, in between each of those <clears throat> times that we changed from one location to another, we were praying that God would provide. We knew we got to the end of the three and a half years at the community center. I just said, Lord, I'm tired. Haven't we proven ourselves faithful? And within two weeks, we had a new location, which was a beautiful church. When we needed to move out of there, we prayed again, Lord, we need another place. Within a week, we had another place. And that's the way it's gone. God has been faithful for our every need. As Junior has said, we've never been in debt. We didn't have to take out money for anything. God has provided every step of the way when it comes to location or whatever the needs of our church needed, God provided and over that period of time, I kept looking. We nice to have a place of your own that you could be open whatever hours you want and have people in. And we kept looking for land, kept looking for buildings, but everything was very, very expensive. Or I finally got to a point where the Lord, if you're going to give us, if we need a building, you're going to have to give us one. And I kept telling that to my wife that God will have to give us a building. I don't know what we're going to do, but we can't. There's nothing out there that we can do without going in debt um, and being strapped, and we spend more time worrying about finances than we are about people's lives. And uh, it got to be kind of a okay, you sure are right. Well, it just happened to be that uh, God must have heard me because uh, all within pretty much one day, uh, we found out that the building was available. Um, as that lady brought it to our attention. I went to check it out. Within a day's time, I ended up working with the town. And the building that we're in, uh, actually, is, uh, a church was closing. Uh, they were decommissioning the, the church. They were going to give it over to the town. And it was all happening that day. And so we went to the town, and we approached them. And the town said, OK, um, we've got a building we're going to get. And I said, yeah, and we've got the people to put in it. And if you give us the building, we'll fill it with people. And so they end up giving us the building. Uh, it is ours. We can do whatever we want to it, raise the roof, build on. It's ours. Uh, and it was at no cost. It was just given to us. And so it's been a journey that we say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Mm -hmm. He's given and given, and he's poured out and poured out. And we just have to say thank you to him. It's so important to make sure that he gets the recognition for what he's done. And not only did he give us a building of our own, but as you'll see in some of the pictures that you'll see in this interview, that it's a very beautiful building. We would never have ever dreamed of having a building like this that we could call our own. We looked at warehouses, we looked at garages, we looked at anything that we could set chairs up in. But God gave us this absolutely beautiful building for free. And um, we, we are just blown away by his goodness and his faithfulness to us in our journey. We, uh, <clears throat> we have to thank uh, Hope of the Generation we are part of the Acts churches, and we are the support that we get from uh, Dr. Wright and from Don, Pastor Donna, and the whole staff down there is just, uh, um, it's almost overwhelming sometimes. It's nice to know that you can call when you have something that's going on in your life mm -hmm. in the church, not knowing exactly how to handle it. We know the scripture, but how do we apply this? And it's nice to be able to have somebody you can call up and say, this is what the situation is. Can you help guide us? What's the Bible say? Or what would you do in this particular case? And they've been able to help us. No matter what church you're in, you're going to have uh, issues that's going to come up. 
But it's nice to be able to have that support to know that they can guide you uh, because they've been somewhere and they've, and they've uh, seen this before. And we're just so thankful to be part of the Acts. Uh, it also gives us the, all of the resources that are available that Pastor uh, Dr. Wright and Pastor uh, Donna has done over the years of teaching. All those resources, we've been, we, we own everything that there is in the library. Uh, we play them over, we read them, we understand them, we try to apply them. And the big thing is, is the process that started back when Janice started talking about her testimony to now is that we saw things in the Word, totally different than what we ever saw before. And it's not like you read a little bit and all because you stop here, we don't talk about it. It's all there in the Word. And try to apply everything that there is uh, to church here in, this, in our flock, and they know that we, we love them, we want to share with them what's God's Word say. And it's all about what's God's Word. And we find that um, we're going to find a lot of different people come in from different uh, denominations, different uh, churches, um, backgrounds, not sure what they understand, um, not, what they've applied. Uh, and so those situations come up, and it gives us the opportunity to be able to say, well, what's God's Word say about it? And what are we going to do to be able to uh, understand and influence this to a point where we can say, okay, I'm willing to change. I had to change some of my thinking that I've had when I started. Mm -hmm. And I'm still learning, still growing, and don't have all the answers. Um, but I guess that's good because I'm looking for God to show me um, this has been a great opportunity for us to be able to share. Uh, we could go on forever about what's happened. I, I just would like to talk about the name of our church. <clears throat> yeah, that'd be good. Um, New Song Church. It, the title New Song Church comes from the scripture in Psalms 40, verse 3, where David was singing the psalm, He's talking about what God had done in his life. He says, and he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our Lord, that many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. I was in the same place what David talked about in verse 2 when he said, and he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. That's what God did for me, my testimony of my sickness. It wasn't just physical sickness, but I also had mental sickness of anxiety. I had anxiety attacks. The enemy was after me. And God was pulling me to himself all that time. And this scripture is a reality for me, for us as a couple, for us as a family. God did bring us up out of that horrible pit out of the miry clay and set our feet upon a solid rock and established our goings. And that's Amen. still happening today. And there is a new song in our mouth and praise unto our lips because of what God has done in our journey, who we are becoming. We aren't the same people we were even 10 years ago when Amen. we started this journey. There's just been so much God has done for us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And the name of our church says it all for us as a couple, uh, what God has done and is still doing in our lives. We have a new song, and we like to sing it. <laughs> Anytime anybody will listen to us, we like to sing about our new song. Amen. Uh, our sign says, a new song church, but this is a gathering, growing in God in love with God, self, and others. And we have uh, such a flock that's here that we do love, um, and on the people that come through the doors. And we're just so thankful that we have an opportunity to be able to share some of the things that today with you. Hopefully it'll be, it has been encouraging to you. Uh, if God's given you a vision, or if God has given you uh, some things He wants you to do, uh, don't be afraid to step out, but trust Him. Make sure it's not the flesh, but to trust Him, and He will bless you. We didn't go to Bible college. We had a teaching from the Holy Spirit in the Word, and if we can do it, you can do it too.
Wow, what a what an awesome journey that the Lambs have had, uh, Granville and Janice. Um, I know I've been able to watch them from you know far a little bit and watch their journey, uh, but I know y'all have had some really close interaction with them. Do you have any just observations, uh, just from your experience with them over the years that you want to share, kind of coming out of what they shared? Well, I just want to say that they really had a heart to help people, and they had said that. And it really shows, because we've had the opportunity, and so has Pastor Benny, for that matter, to be able to go and visit their church and to be a part of what they're doing. And the people are just amazing there. And there's a real sense of loving community in their midst. And so they've really fostered that very well. And so we're just thrilled with how they've grown from like like an ordinary person to mm-hmm. now they're pastoring and they're doing a great job. And I don't know if you noticed that on their um, uh, their testimony, they 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 said they're they're co pastors. They pastor together, husband and wife do it together, and they do a very good job. And they just really. Um, they really bless everyone because then you get both sides, kind of the male, female, you know, part of this and, and, um, they've both grown in it so much. I really, they've come alive as Christians, uh, realizing there's what happened at the cross is something that can be experienced today of freedom. And the gospel must involve not just <clears throat> the promise of eternal life but it must involve a possible change here in the temporal life. And, and, and so we don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy the blessings of God. They embraced that. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they found themselves moving from one stage of Christianity to an exciting stage, which they embraced totally. And the people that are there in their fellowship are so blessed to have people who know how to care for them. Mm-hmm not just lead them to heaven. You know why? Because they themselves were also cared for. Yes. yes. And so they're able to give that yeah. back out. That's, that's great. Okay, so you may have noticed that there's more people here with us now. We've got all, we got all of the elders yes, of Hope the Generations Church up here. here. Yeah. Wow. So let's start in the back here. We've got Pastor Scott, Pastor John, who's been with us here, his wife, Pastor Adrian, Pastor Benny, and we still definitely have Pastor Donna and Pastor Henry here. So oh, wait a minute. And there's Elder David because you're uh, you're a teaching elder here. So yes. we have all the elders. All of them. That's part of that fivefold eldership in Ephesians. This is a teaching elder. Yeah. So here's here's why we've brought um, all of our pastors up here is because they've had a journey too, just like you know anybody out there that may be considering becoming an Acts pastor. So. I want to ask you all some questions about your journey that maybe uh, the people listening, they can glean from and that maybe possibly the Holy Spirit could use to kind of help them, you know, nudge them along in their journey. So, Pastor Benny, I, I want to start with you, okay? Yeah, go ahead and grab the mic there. Okay. Now, you were, uh, before you came here, you were an elder in an organization, right? In an organized church. Um, you'd, you'd been a missionary to Africa for a season of your life. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I kind of want to hear what was being offered at Hope of the Generations Church that re- you really embraced? And what was the transition like for you and your wife, Jody in, in, this, in, this, um, in transitioning into what you embraced here at Hope of the Generations Church? What did that look like for you? Well, it, it really required a lot of... Uh, going back and looking at what I had been taught and saying, okay, I got to look at the scriptures again and see what God is really saying. Because my, my, um, my journey started out when I was about 13 years old, and uh, I walked the aisles of a Baptist church, like many people do. And I had, uh, you know, I felt great after that experience, and then the next day I, I found myself in some of the same sins that I wanted to get out of. So you didn't become sinless when you got... I did not. Okay. <laughs> and I really struggled, and I went to my religious leaders, and I said, hey, I'm struggling with this. Uh, what should I do? How do you get out of this? And uh, I got a good answer. They said, stop doing it. <laughs> and I said, well, I've been trying that method, and it hadn't worked for a long time now, is there anything else in the gospel to help me stop doing it? You know, and I said, I agree with you, I should stop doing it. But that 
you know, I miserably failed in that for a long, long time, and it was uh, very discouraging. And I ended up at my sister's church out in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I went to a service one night, and they were teaching on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I looked at it, I looked at the scripture, and I said, yeah, I want that. But nobody had ever said that to me in my journey. I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, while we were vacationing in the DFW area, uh, my sister took me through some deliverance. I repented for some sin, and she cast out some devils. Yeah, and, you know, that was a new experience for me, and it really got a lot of victory over sin that I'd never had victory over it. So that was my first experience, really, with uh, deliverance. And uh, from there, we moved to Orlando, Florida, and I joined a PCA, Presbyterian Church of America, and was an elder there, uh-huh. and went through a lot of training there. They have a, over a year of worth of training and then a test at the end on scripture. And so after that test and I passed, I went to the pastor and I said, you know, now I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Is that okay here? (laughs) And he said, yeah, we believe in that. I said, well, you don't teach it or talk about it. He said, well, we just, you know, we don't do that. It's just too controversial for our people. And so, you know, we kind of lost some of the role we had from back when we were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so that was kind of a a religious, another religion experience of uh, some rule keeping and, you know, more learning and knowledge, but never really coming to the knowledge of the the truth. And when I uh, came down to Open Generations Church, um, we began to see deliverance and baptism, you know, the Holy Spirit working and kind of reignited us. My wife and I were just traveling around at the time. I was taking some time off from work, and uh, I was out back at my sister's place again. A lot of stuff seemed to go on there. And she gave me some books from Hope of Generations Church, and she said, I don't have time to read these. One of my people went to a, a conference that Pastor Henry Wright was holding here in the DFW area, and they brought this material and said, I should read it, and I don't have time, so would you read it and tell me if I if it's any good and do I need to read it? So I said, sure, I got plenty of time. I'm not working now, so I read it. I said, boy, this is really some good material. You need to read this. So we were living in Florida. We went home, and we were traveling north up to Georgia for some other uh, vacation time, and we decided to stop by here, and that's when I met Pastor John back there, and he he gave me a, a tour of uh, the church, bought a whole bunch of more uh, material, found out what was happening here, and we returned back to Florida. We started studying the material, and then we decided to come to the two-week program here. We came, and uh, when we came, we didn't think we had anything wrong with us. And I had had allergies all my life, and my wife, we were married 45 years, and uh, she had really bad asthma for those those years in our marriage. And we just thought, hey, we've had this all our life. There's nothing you can do about it. So we went through a a program here, and we both got healed. I got healed of my allergies. She got healed of her asthma. And uh, I said to myself, God, finally something that really Work. See, mm-hmm. when, I, when I went through some deliverance earlier, I never related that, that you could be healed of disease by repentance and the casting out of evil spirits or devils. And I had never tied that together. So we came here. We didn't even put those things on our, on our sheet because we didn't, we didn't think there was a possibility uh, uh, even being healed from that. So that's... That's what we, one of the major things we learned, one of the big transitions, and when we saw how it worked, we said, man, we got to be a part of this because this could help a lot of people. So we volunteered for three months and then uh, came on staff, and we just love it here, love helping people, 
And that's kind of our transition. So you were you were an elder in in a another you know denomination. Yes. But then you decided through this course what you're talking about here uh, over time reading books materials healing comes you you decided to to move here you volunteered you end up coming on staff but you were not an elder here at Hope of the Generations like you are now. So well, could you tell us a little bit about kind of I don't know, uh, what, what, what was it going on inside your heart that made you think maybe I would want to serve at that level of an elder or a pastor here at Hope the Generations Church when that was the opportunity was put in front of you? Well, I, you know, it's always been in my heart to help people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always kind of everywhere I've ever been, been a person that uh, taught people. People would come to me and have questions. And I, I love to help people. I love to answer their questions from a biblical standpoint. And, and I learned a lot about how God really thinks here. And I wanted to share that with people uh, because it was a new level of how God thought that I had learned here. And I thought it was important that, you know, that I serve the people and help them experience what I experienced here. So I hope that answers yeah, your good. question. And I certainly have observed those characteristics in your life and greatly appreciate that. So thank you so much. Okay, Pastor Scott, way on back there. Uh, when you first arrived at Hope of the Generations Church, you were working full-time in law enforcement. And if I understand correctly, you had no intention of changing that, right? No, my entire career was laid out for me with the local department here. And I was, that was career life. I wasn't planning on changing. So you're going full-time law enforcement, you know, maybe to come be a part of a, a flock, you know, good, but as far as your career path, law enforcement. So well, I wasn't even looking to get into a church. Oh, you weren't even, okay, so you weren't I, even no, looking to get into a church. It wasn't even like not trying to find a church. It was, I didn't, if God was on the left side, I was going right and didn't want anywhere near God. Well, well, then tell, tell everybody listening here a little bit about how you ended up here and what was it about what you saw and what was happening that kept you coming back? I had gone through some really rough stuff in my world, in my life, and being adopted, my adopted parents had passed away or were getting older, mm -hmm. and my adopted dad didn't really want much to do with me, so my life evolved into law enforcement 100 percent. that was it was the safety net it was the brotherhood it was those are the people who had your back because nobody else would and had gone through a divorce and wasn't really looking for god or anything else but just my night shift and that was it and god brought somebody into my life that made me start being a little bit more safer and uh, we started dating at the time, and she um, had to be at church on a Sunday morning. And uh, she had been traveling with Dr. Henry and Pastor Donna, who happens to be their daughter, and I've been traveling with them in Alaska during a conference. And this was way back before we had carpet in the sanctuary, before there was an axe program, before there was an open mic there was, it was metal chairs and a metal thing and a basketball hoop still on the wall. That was, that was church. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I walked in the door. She said, I, I haven't seen you in a while, so you're coming to church with me. I'm like, no, I'm not. I haven't stepped foot in a church in three years. I don't plan on starting back this morning. Got off night shift. I'm going to bed. She says, nope, you're coming to church with me. Okay, and I remember walking in the doors, and uh, there was a gentleman back at the time who was coming here and said, any friend of Sarah's is a friend of mine, and gave me a big old huge bear hug and about lifted me off my feet. Mm. And you got to understand, from my background, you don't get arm's reach. I mean, Pastor John's sitting about as close as anyone would back then, and he grabbed me and hugged me, and next thing I realize, I'm now in engulfed in people and people start loving and and a few weeks later I met pastors Henry and Donna and there was something about them that I had never seen in a pastor um there was a heart for people 
Now, I've had some great pastors in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're watching, which I kind of hope they are, then, you know, not talking about them. You know, but I had some great pastors that had a great heart, but there was something about that they had for people that I hadn't hadn't felt, experienced, sensed, felt in my heart in years. And they had a love for people that I didn't understand. I didn't get it. I didn't understand how they could travel and, and love people and love their family and just their heart would expand as more and more people came in and and it would just continue to grow. And, you know, it was a, it was even the Lambs made a comment about their the new song, their church. It's where the love of God kind of just envelops people and draws them in. And for what I experienced walking into a church that I hadn't in some of my past, it wasn't religion. It wasn't just let's get in here, sing a song, sit down, listen for 30 minutes, stand up, take up an offering and leave. It was really we're going to take time for people's hearts. And so what kind of drew me in, if you will, is the love that the church, mm. not organization, not religion, but the church, what God originally saw forth way back when 2,000 years ago when he said, you guys need to go out and love on people and disciple them and bring them in the fold. What drew me in, what kept me here, I mean, we're talking, that was 99, and I've been here ever since. And, um, you know, this is now where I work. My family's here. My kids go to school here as part of the church. And it's what is uh, woven. That's a good word. I like mm -hmm. that. Woven into everything that a shepherd does is the love for those sheep. It's not about what you're going to get out of it. It's not, you're not going to get the pat on the back said, hey, good job, because if you're looking for that, you're probably in it for the wrong reasons. But there's this love for the sheep that just envelops a shepherd's heart. That's why he deals with the lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. It's mm -hmm. why he is available to baptize, why he's available to, um, you know, be at bedsides when, when he needs to be. It's the love for the sheep, and so I, I think I answered it. That's what kind of kept me here. Yeah, so that's what kept you coming back. N now you had this this place where, again, you were, that love is there, and, and it's healing your heart, And but you still have this place of, you have this career of law enforcement, and there was a place where that had to switch. What what was it that, not even to become a pastor, but what was it that that switched inside of you to where you, you thought you wanted to give who you were not to law enforcement, all due respect to law enforcement, because we certainly honor you, mm -hmm. um, but you wanted to give your heart to uh, what was happening here at Hope the Generations Church, not, not even in the office of a, a pastor, but just, you know, because you were just on the, on the team here for years before you ever had that opportunity. Wow. Um, I remember sitting at the dinner table and Pastor Henry and Donna, which mom and dad and past, actually there was Pastor Henry back then and Pastor Dad looked at me and said, hey, I got an opening. I'm looking for somebody in communications. I'm a cop. We don't do communications. No offense to anybody, but it's not our best suit. It's freeze and on the ground that's our communication gap you know but he said I, i'm looking for somebody and i remember looking at him and and going well i'll i'll ask around if somebody's interested and sarah nudged me she's talking about he's talking about you i'm like what and i had always wanted to help people i remember being in children's church way back when i was 10 and 11 and 12 wanting to help people learn real life you know, I was that guy, I was the kid that would eat the chocolate-covered onion to prove the point that looks can be deceiving. You know, to prove the real practical application of, of life kind of thing. And, and I always wanted to help people. And I had, my, in thinking about my life, it was about having money, being secure, 
and that kind of thing. And I remember when I finally made the decision to, to trust God, mm. something I hadn't really done very well in my life. And it was a huge stretch for me to leave something I knew was secure to work for basically an offering. And I remember between Pastor Henry and God, they said there's a couple of things will always happen. You'll always have a roof over your head, food in your belly, and clothes on your back. He goes, outside of that, can't promise you a thing. And I remember saying, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll do this. But there was, there, was a, there was a piece that I had in my heart that this was a good thing. I, I was, the life of law enforcement takes you to where you don't trust people. You don't look over your back. You're, anyone who comes up to you, you're questioning their motives. It's not a good, I mean, I appreciate everybody's out there, and I still have my, my associates and my friends that I pray for, and I still talk to. And that's where they need to be. But God, I felt God was changing my job function. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement, most people who join law enforcement is they want to take care of people. They want to make a difference in their communities and people's lives. It didn't change. I still want to help people. I still want to make a difference in people's lives. My job function you know, is different. I now take care of people's hearts more than I do their safety. But I still take care of their safety. You know, it's all enveloped, but somewhere along the way, God just, you know, you, you can't do this. I've got something bigger and better for you. And I remember writing with Pastor Henry later on. He goes, I don't know what this looks like in your future. He goes, but I really feel God has something in your life that I want to invest into. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, I'm not going to try and define it because you'll mess it up kind of thing. But I want to invest in you because God's got something for you that you need to grow into. And I knew at 12 years old, I, was gonna, I, I had the calling, if you want to say, to be a pastor. And from 12 years old to 20-something, I ran from it the opposite direction. And even growing up here in the few years before being a pastor... I was taking care of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about your a man's gifts make room for him. And I was taking care of sheep. I was taking care of youth. I was taking care of, you know, what needed to be done. Deacon of the chairs, you know, and other various things. And, and God just said, hey, you know, it's time for you to do what you've been called to do. And even then, it's taken me a few years to really grow into some of those things. It's not like... You flip a switch and, hey, you're a pastor, and now you're going to say all the right things. I was, you know, I was the guy looking, going, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I, you know, that's reading and speaking were never my strong suits, you know. And so, um, and here I am. Uh, well, I've been a pastor for, was it 10 years now, somewhere right through there? And it feels like yesterday. And yet, at the same time, it feels like this is what we've been doing our entire life, and it feels good, and it's at the end of the night you, when you help people and serve people and not being downtrodden on, not to be walked on, but when you really out of your heart serve somebody for their heart, to get them back in the kingdom or even just keep them alive long enough for God to talk to their heart, spiritually speaking. You know, there's this, there's this thing inside your heart that just kind of warms and grows and expands, and you look for the next sheep to go grab off the cliff. Wow, thank you so much for sharing, Pastor Scott. I, I want to draw out a quick observation that I've heard from everybody so far, and I'll probably hear it from y'all too, but uh, Pastor John and Pastor Adrian. But uh, I want y'all to think about this that are listening. Nobody you, that you've heard from started doing the things that Pastor does when they, be, when they were actually called a pastor. They were doing these things long before they were ever called a pastor. At some point, they, it, it, they just got the title and the office because they'd already been doing it, already been faithful for years. So, you know, that's something to think about in your decision making as, as God works with you. If this would be something, Acts would be something that you're going to be a part of in your journey. Okay, so thank you so much, Pastor Benny and Pastor Scott, for sharing. I want to come to Pastor John and Pastor Adrian. Um, now, y'all moved here right off of your honeymoon, right? I moved That's to right. Thomas in Georgia. 
When was it? What year was that? 2000. You're 2000. Okay. Why did you decide to do that? Well, when I first met Pastor John, he was just a guy. I lived overseas. I did church planting in a former Soviet Republic, Islamic country. And I met him, and he was the sick guy. He was the guy... Sick as a dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, over laying down in the floor was all he could do at our dinner party. And then he disappeared because he was too sick to stay. So um, when I met him again a year and a half later, he and his two siblings, who had also been sick 8 and 14 years, were healed. Heal as an ox, strong as an ox, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if your sisters would like no, being no, called <laughs> gazelles, healthy gazelles. I was doing so much better. You, yep. you were. It was like I was in a dream. It felt, I was, yes. life was completely took a 180 and I was enjoying it. So when I saw you healed and um, soon after that we were engaged and we were talking about where we would like to start our, our marriage and I, I'm telling you, it really caught my attention that you had been sick four years, your other sister eight, your other sister 14. They were all healed through what was taught here at Hope of the Generations Church. Mm-hmm. And they had some, one had read a more excellent way and applied it to her life and was healed within three months. And another one came here for a period of time and was healed. And you were healed before you even knew what happened as you were, were giving out to others in your own need. So we were just driving down the highway thinking, you know, let's start our marriage where there's a good church. Let's just be a part of a really good church and find out who we are as a married couple, as we are becoming one. And we gave it one year. So, so your I plan s- was to stay here for one year, then go yes. off and do something yes. wonderful. Well, it was just so open-ended. We didn't know if we really had a permanent place in here. You know how church life is. It just seems like, and we grew from big churches in our background, so it just seems like you could be transient. You just go to a church and you just kind of leave a church and it's just not a big deal. That's how I kind of felt coming into the whole thing. (laughs) And we also thought, because we met overseas doing church planting, we thought maybe there's a place for us overseas. We didn't know. So we, we named a few churches and I said, and you mentioned this one, and I said, you know, I'd like to go learn from that church. You know, I don't know a lot of people that have been healed radically like that. And so, yeah, let's just go there. And I said, you know, it's... Oh, I love this part. It's 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 not just that, you know, our family totally, like Jana said, we felt like we got um, saved again. Mm -hmm. You know, our whole family got a total 2.0 on Christianity. We just felt like now we were believers, like our whole family. And so to come to this place where it was the, the, the pivot point for our lives, I said, you know, not only do the, is it just a great place to learn about healing and because I would study physical therapy. And you're like, but check this out. The, the, the senior pastor, he loves his wife. He still chases her around, and they've been married a while. Now, get this. I grew I, I'm up, quoting you from uh, yes. that many years ago. He, he still chases her around. Now, the reason why I said this is because I grew up as a missionary kid and a pastor's kid, and I saw that behind the scenes, um, it's like it's not thriving. It's surviving world. I mean, you just in in serving God, it just is not all pretty, pretty. Okay. So when I saw that as a missionary kid and a pastor's kid, not like directly, cause I was a kid, but I kind of understood that there was a perspective about serving God that was difficult. And, and we would hear of missionaries where the husband and wife would just not be married anymore. And as a kid, I couldn't get that. I just mm. like, why they're supposed to love God. And, but I, I said to her, I was like, And this guy, he loves her and he chases her around. So I think not only do they have a fruit of of the gospel, but they have a fruit in their relationship. And I said, I want to learn how to love you and serve God at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about um, their background and family experiences weren't weren't all rosy, but they had pulled their family together and had a lot of love in their family. And I'll tell you, I knew God healed people here. And that caught my attention. But as a new wife, what got me really excited was like, hey, I want to I want to sign up for this to make sure we have a lifelong marriage that's going to be awesome. 
So that's why we came here. So you, you came here and you ended up staying, obviously. Um, it's been a long year. Yeah, that's all. It's been a long year, y'all. Um, but you know, y'all y'all both joined the team here. You came on staff, and and y'all were on staff for for years before um, either one of you was ever called a pastor. I want to say something. Yes, there. go ahead. We they did come on, and we called them the AJ team. Okay? The AJ team. AJ team. It was Adrian and John. AJ team. The AJ team. AJ team. And, There's probably uh, a song that could go with that. <laughs> And, so and, and actually, they got, they were, it was a love-hate relationship with certain staff members because they were, they were like the invading mercenaries on behalf of the pastors. <laughs> uh, because we set things in motion to make things, we, we were growing, yeah. and, and they were called to execute it. Yeah. And people feel like they're being executed. <laughs> no, not really. Wow. But we smiled. It wasn't that bad. We, we smiled. We'll talk about that later. It wasn't that bad, but they were part of the executive team. And their job was to was to ensure it happened, right? So I could concentrate more on reading of the word, prayer, and chasing my wife. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there you go. And so y'all did y'all y'all functioned in out. various departments and uh, sectors. You know, here at Hope of the Generations Church, y- y'all between both of you probably seen at least every department. You know, between the two of y'all that there is to offer here. Um, so that's what y'all were doing faithfully for, for many, many years. Uh, what was it that was happening on the inside of y'all that, uh, individually now, okay, where you thought, you, you know, something's happening where, you know, maybe there, God is calling me to another level of service as um, a pastor. Ladies first. I was hoping you would go first. <laughs> well, you know, you came here and to Thomaston and worked at the physical therapy department at the hospital. I got to tell you, so I will go. Um, So I loved physical therapy. I studied it for several years and then actually prayed and got the job down the street and I was in it for 18 months and I loved all the little grandmas and I loved what I did. But I taught one class one time a month called Our Identity, Who We Are and Who We Are Not in Christ, very much similar to His Ways Versus Our Ways. And I, sorry, I taught it here. And I was released by my employment to come here, and I was, and I loved that one class. But the burning in my heart was becoming greater and greater just, and I looked so much more forward to teaching that one class than my, my work environment back at the hospital. And all that I studied for and all that I, I just started playing around in my mind is like, I, I could actually use that information and the background of my, my knowledge to, to be coupled with spiritual information to help people. I mean, I just, I felt like it was an upgrade to the service that I went into physical therapy for. I said, I can't, I mean, how can I just know all this about the spirit of a person and just tend to their physical body? And as much as I enjoyed the physical um, I saw the impact that this, this church was making. And so I remember the cavitation inside my body. I mean, literally, I was shaking for several days because when the transition came, when I was leaving that employment and coming to here, this is very much the same, like, hey, you'll have a roof, you'll have food and clothes. And <laughs> leaving what was pretty well you know, provided for, I remember the stirring, and at, and at this point, I, re- I would say that it was most likely iniquity that just was being dealt with at that point because I was moving away from something that was not wanting me to fully serve God at that level. And I, I, it was a wrestling match, folks. Mm-hmm. It was tough. But I, I just, when I finally got here, it was just like this huge relief that I knew that I was in the heart and in the will of the Father. And so that's how I kind of get, got into this pathway of just, just like, how can I help? What, what can I do? And, and just being a part of the church services and finding the, a platform on the open mic and finding that, hey, what I studied in the Word of God, it fit. It fit in the church service. It was so exciting to see the connectivity that what I was doing you know, personally, I was seeing it come out corporately. And so that's what um, I saw kind of as the growth pattern of, of just coming into uh, being an elder, a pastor. Uh, um. How about you, girl? 
Yeah, what's exactly the question now? That yeah. was so engaging, I got down memory lane. Yeah, just, well, I mean, could, could you kind of explain your journey, what was going on in the, on the inside of you, you know, that, that, you know, kind of led you to think, you know, maybe this is some, a level I want to serve at? Well, I, you know, I remember even as a four-year-old just having my heart exploding on the inside for God mm -hmm. and going to my parents and going to the pastor and the pastor saying, well, she's too young to understand this. I'm telling you, I wasn't too young. My heart was just, was bursting for the Lord. And so, you know, I, I made it through, you know, my teen years and I, um, I, I, there was a place that I really knew I had, I had to lay down everything for the Lord, lay down my reputation, lay down my plans, lay down anything for him. And I, and not long after that, my pastor's wife at just a nice, sweet city church in the Dallas area called me and asked me to come over for popcorn and tea or something, popcorn and sweet tea. And she said, Adrian, I just want to tell you, you're being prepared to be a pastor's wife. And I said, all right. And then what that looked like to me, you know, I, of how I understood pastors' wives and what they did didn't look super exciting, but I'm okay to be married. And, and I already knew God was calling me into um, just walking a really narrow life with him. And so when I went overseas, I really knew I, I just burnt up every opportunity for marriage when I went overseas to a, a third world country. But that's where I met John, doing what was on my heart and that he was there doing what was on his heart. And what that was is I've always enjoyed helping people who feel like they're kind of stuck in their relationship with God, listening to them and talking to them and watching the understanding come to them that something's removed so they can be closer to God. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I feel like I'm more Adrian than mm -hmm. anything else I'm doing. That's just one of my, my deep joys. And so as I was here, when we first got here, um, you know, we, our plan was just to work part time and spend the other rest of our days just being married. So I called up here and I think you were like the second and paid employee pastor. I don't think you were a paid employee for like <laughs> till recently, right? <laughs> it's been a while. You weren't the first. Right. You weren't the first. Uh, I think Kyleen was first. You were second. And um, I kept calling up here. I was looking anywhere for a little job. And so I answered the phone up here 20 hours a week. And I'm telling you, that phone rang like a lot. It, 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 I earned my... The internet did not really exist <laughs> no. back in the year 2000. I we earned were just, no. The millennium bug just, yeah, Y2K bug just scared everybody off from owning a computer. Yeah. So I'm telling you, I worked, I was a college graduate and I needed my whole college education to be able to answer that phone because it was hard work. And then um, from there, Pastor, you asked if I would oversee international communications and um, help with the AJ team and different things. But I think... What, you know, when you are who you are, you just do what you do. Yeah. And so God would just have me, you know, listen to people, encourage them, talk to them. And I would see they would, something would happen. You know, they would, something would happen and they would understand how to be closer to God and be at peace with God. And these are believers. And, and I watched you and your journey, um, become a pastor. And I remember before you became a pastor, by our bedside, I had the book Ordination. And Pastor Henry, it's the talk you did about what it means to be ordained as an elder. And I read that whole thing, and I remember just kind of sitting it down by the bedside. And my whole summation of that book was being an elder is a lot of work. A lot, I mean, meaning you lay down your life. Mm -hmm. And Pastor, you would say many times that as a pastor, you have. Um, like peel out marks on your back, skid marks. And what you mean is like you were down serving somebody and they just ran their car right over you. Is that what you meant? Yeah. And I guess that's what really surprised me is um, watching the two of you become pastors is that 
you lay down your lives in opposition would come to you. And as much as the three of you have laid down your lives in love, that op more opposition has come towards you. And I know that's just the way the enemy tries to discourage. You know, uh, you've triggered something within me that an organization rules, but an organism serves. It's good. And, and Jesus said this, he that would be greatest amongst you is servant of all. Mm -hmm. And you think about the living word, having a cushy job in heaven, being with the Father. I mean, what a cushy job. And he lays down his life as God, lowers himself beneath the angels, and literally becomes one of us humans to die for us. That we might live. Mm -hmm. That's having skid marks on your backside. Mm -hmm. Because you're always bearing up under someone for their betterment. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're an under-shepherd of the Lord, he did it first. He did it first. And it's a small thing to serve. You say, well, it's a lot of work. Um, as there was everything. You know, sleeping can be a lot of work. Uh, especially when you sleep too long, you wake, wake up sore. And uh, so everything requires an effort. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing wrong with effort. There's nothing wrong with being activated. There's nothing wrong with loving and caring. So Adrian, you just triggered that in me. I didn't mean to take over your conversation, but, but I wanted you, you triggered something that, that our greatness that qualifies us to be kings and priests in the millennium is because we care now. Mm -hmm. Not then, but we care now. So as I put that book down and understood that as my husband was being called and released into being a pastor, that, that I was being called and released into supporting him in that. And I think that was even part of my, I know it was part of my training. I know we were being trained to be pastors before we even knew we were being trained to be pastors. We paid a lot of attention mm -hmm. to our church services. I remember many times Pastor Donna coming to you at the end of the service and saying, so what did you think about that? Like, why did that happen? And what did you think about what they said? And you'd help me process it. And I just was always so curious and watching. And you taught me so well in those years. Of, we had those little, do you remember those side conversations? <laughs> so then as um, I was supporting you and... Um, you know, over time I could tell that I was laboring with you more and more. And how many times we would be in a conversation together with somebody and I could tell that I needed you and you needed me. And that um, something that I really appreciate is watching how you two work together and I watch how the flock appreciates when you two work together and how, Pastor Henry, as, as a man, that you have made provision and room for a woman to be a pastor with her husband and covered us in that. And so um, as this door opened for me, I remember when you came and got me to bring me, uh, the elders wanted to meet with me. I had this moment, and it entering into being a pastor was a very similar feeling when I knew we were going to get engaged to be married. Mm -hmm. I knew it, this was a lifelong commitment, mm -hmm. and I knew that it was very exciting. God was in it, and it was a, a very important engagement in my life. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day that you all surrounded me and laid your hands on me and prayed for me. And I know some of you even wept. I wept. I know, God, what you said is that for me to be prepared, that God would give me even more things that I needed in order that I could serve the body. And I, from that day on, more and more of that happens, has been happening. And so 
Um, that's, those are the things that were going off inside of me in my journey of becoming a pastor with John. Wow. Wow. You know, yeah, you know, we we brought all the pastors up here because we want you to hear, you know, about their journey, but we also want you to hear their heartbeat. Um, you know, the the journey of becoming a pastor is it, it's it's one that's exciting and it's one that's full of a lot of great things. But I, I also want to draw the seriousness of it and the commitment of it. And those are all things to consider um, as you're listening to this. Uh, so thank you so much for your honesty and for sharing, because I know that God can really use that in helping people come to a place of decision for what God may have them to do in their local communities. Is there something you'd like to share uh, real quick? I had a thought coming, okay, and it's undeveloped, <laughs> but it's coming. Uh, could you give me a second? I'm in the right chapter. Yeah, we can give you a second. And um, <laughs> um, give you a minute. Let's see. Uh, okay, you know, I I heard this thing. Uh, I heard it in the heavenlies, and I want to address it to some of you uh, females that God may be dealing with. Uh, and uh, you know that here at Hope of the Generations, we have we have two female pastors, and we have another one that has retired. Pastor Anita. And, and I was thinking about when Adam and Eve were created, and I had this quickening, so I had to go look it up. And uh, uh, let's see what it says here. Um, no, I had it in front of me, and it ran away. Um, let's see. Uh, I made him help me, and it says, and they, they uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, well, I'm going to find it eventually, because I know what's here. And it is, is when God created Adam, and he created Eve to be his helpmate, he gave both of them dominion. Mm -hmm. Now, Eve was to be under the leadership of her husband, and, and, but then she listened to the voice, and that created the problem. And... But both of them were given the instructions to care for what God created. Be fruitful. Later came be fruitful, multiply. So she joined her husband in the garden. And when, when God would come and walk in the cool of the evening, he would come and walk with both of them, not just one of them. Mm -hmm. And that brings us into a powerful understanding of what being one flesh is all about. Because sometimes a disconnect is that we still think in terms of one plus one equals one equals two. Two. When it actually, when you become one flesh, one plus one equals one, and that is a dimension that I believe is is misunderstood and misapplied, and and I think one of the greatest tragedies because even in Jesus's ministry, and even in the early church, there was a provision for the ladies to serve. Phoebe was a deaconess. And you look up the word deaconess, she, uh, she was a deacon. She was an elder, an assistant to the elders. So you have this provision. And, and sometimes in the, in the uh, um, organization of Christianity, we, we've taken certain scriptures and used them against females. Uh, I learned one thing from the Apostle Paul. I'm going to get off this subject because it's a dangerous one. Because it, it lends itself to argument. But what I did learn from the teachings of Paul is that in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, but all have been made equal partakers of the promises and the benefits. And the administration in the millennium won't just be male. Mm-hmm. It'll be male and female because we're all grafted in as Christ's wife. That is our promise. That is the bride. That's who we are. And the bride of Christ in the future is not just male. It's all believers that came to the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I, I want to release in this conversation some of you females from the uh, suppression of your calling. Now, we do believe there is an oversight that can protect you in this journey. 
And I know that, that uh, there's a, not a female teaching here at Hope of the Generations or For My Life or as a pastor that is not in subjection one to another as we are to each other as men. So we all serve together under the umbrella of our calling. And it works wonderfully. And there's no schism. There's no division. And I want to say there's a real safety in that. Um, you know, I, and I wanted to say also, too, that those of you that are called to be pastors, I want to let you know that the whole family is. Okay? It, it, the whole family is, it, it, you, it, it's a family thing. It's not just because there's a lot of times when Henry was not available or, or he, you know, he was on the phones with it, there's a, there's a, there's something that comes that if, if, if the head of the family will recognize that, the whole family is called to this, not just Henry, not just myself. Also, I wanted to say that um, Pastor Adrian wasn't always uh, a pastor with John, but she supported John as part of that, um, that, that, um, that, that team, if you would, the AJ team, <laughs> even as he was a pastor, and then in her own right was called to be a pastor. Pastor Benny, his wife, is not Pastor Jody, but I can guarantee you that she supports him and everything he does and is with him on many occasions as they as he functions, yeah, all the time, as he says, and, and as he functions. Same with Sarah, with uh, Pastor Scott. They, we, we function together as husbands and wives. And so that has to be an understood reality because it's not just a man who gets to stand there or even a female gets to stand there alone alone in this calling. It is a husband and wife team, some way, somehow. And, and, and even when you saw um, Janice and Granville, you saw they are a team. And, but the family is also a big part of this because they have to give and take. They have to be able to, they see and hear things like you even said that you, uh, who was it that said they saw things? Uh, oh, it was Pastor John. You know, in the mission field, didn't see that, the, that you know, that pe people were married, they weren't married. There's a lot of things that children see. Mm -hmm. And so you have to take that into account. How is my, you know, is my family has to be called to this too. So I wanted to add that. Well, I want to continue with what some of what you're talking about here because you know we've discussed a lot of things today we have unfolded a lot of things we have presented uh, this opportunity uh, of acts the association of churches teaching and serving and and there comes a place of decision and I'd like for you to discuss you know what are some of those things because this whole family aspect is one of them what are some of those things that they may need to be considering in their decision making that may not be always be the obvious okay Things like family dynamics, lifestyle dynamics, things like that. Uh, you want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, I'm just saying that as the wife, you know, as the wife of a mother. and the mother, right, of of a, of a pastor, and not just a pastor, but a founder, and I mean, we, and, you know, conference speaker, and all those things. There was a lot of um, sacrifices that were made, and I'm sure it's not unlike those going to the mission field, et cetera, but there's a lot of sacrifices that a family makes, especially with the time that he can share. But I'm gonna tell you that you have to think of ways to make your time quality and so that there's no bitterness that comes about. You have to think about those things. My, for myself, I never had, a, I never had an issue with um, Henry, um, praying with like anybody, but especially females. I didn't have a problem as long as, he, as someone was around, you know, like to be able to witness this. If it wasn't myself, it would be someone else. And those are dynamics we would talk about with, with an ax uh, applicant about the, the propriety of that. But the reason why I was okay, I never had a jealous bone in my body about this because what I received um, from God from the things that he taught, I wanted everybody to have. I mean, I was, I wanted everyone to, to experience that. I wanted them to have that. So I, I never was concerned about that. I didn't, I was never upset with the time that was spent. But you also have to, you know, make limitations because, mm -hmm. you know, your first church is your family. So you have to remember that you don't go and spend all your time in the, ch in, the, in the flock and then leave your family stranded, there has to be parameters of time that, that they both, that the couple and the family 
decide, especially the parents, I'm talking about the husband and wife, that has to be something that you sit down and you say, this is going to be okay with me, this is not going to be okay with me, and you have to really talk about those things. In organized religion, there's a pattern in which it's all male leadership. It's taught, it is enforced, and, and I've heard many sad stories of wives who have been abandoned uh, why, and the children, while the pastoring, elder, evangelist, whatever, male, spends all of his time with others, but no time with his wife or his children. And there's a disconnect that comes to them. I have a powerful thought coming to me. Uh, you can check me on it, the rest of the elders, because I, I'm going to ask a question, because it came to me, and it may be the Holy Spirit, hopefully it is, is in the millennium, does Jesus rule by himself? Who rules with him? Hopefully we do. No, no, no. I, I, I want a specific okay. answer. Who, no, no, he, we're not a, yeah, well, we are a bride, but who rules with him? No, his wife. Okay, well, bride. No, 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 we're, the, we're, the, we're betrothed, we're the bride of Christ. No, in that day, we are his wife. Not in the carnal sense. Don't stumble over this term. But as the eternal helpmate, he doesn't rule by himself as the male head, because he is male gender in that sense. Correct. As a human. Yep. But he rules with his wife. But the wife is male and female. So if we're going to pattern this after that pattern, then why don't we practice it now under his headship, male and female? Mm -hmm. So what are some other... Oh, what you got, Pastor Benny? Well, I just want to say, you know, uh, think back... When uh, I became an elder in the PCA church, we our ministry, Jody and I's ministry, was uh, to the divorcees of the church. And we had a church of, uh, it was over 1,200 people, and there were a lot of women divorcees. And when I accepted that position, I had to go to my wife and say, you know, we I can't go minister to these women by myself. When I make this commitment of time, you have to make it with me because I'm not going to go by myself because that would be improper. So, uh, you know, she made a bigger commitment that I, you know, the same commitment I made. And we, we've always worked together hand in hand. And everywhere I've gone, she's gone and supported me. And she is, to me, is more important uh, than I am because I could have never done what I'd what I've been able to do w without her support. So if you do decide to accept this challenge, you need to have that conversation with your family and everybody is going to need to commit. Uh, well, you commit to your family first, the first ministry is to your family, but whatever time is left, you have to do it as a family. I'd like to add something, you know, in pastoring, so much of what we do is very relational. We help people with their relationships. Mm -hmm. And we have found that the practice ground to really help others is how we help one another in our own marriage. Mm -hmm. And I know over the years we've had different, um, sometimes a man come to us and say he wants to replicate what we're doing. He wants to teach these wonderful principles, you know, about bitterness and unforgiveness and spiritual roots and envy and jealousy and godly order to all these people. But we find out later down the road, he's not able to apply them with his own wife. And so we've got somebody who, who can teach it and talk about it, but there, I'll tell you where you're going to learn to be a doer of it is in your own relationship. And I know many things that the two of you have taught um, you may not publicly say it, and it may not be all the time, but you had those revelations working out your own salvation in your own relationship. So I just want to say that a decision to come forth to understand your calling to be a pastor, you need to know that you've been able to walk out these principles in a marriage for a, a period of time where you understand you are being changed, you are walking out godly order, you are laying down your life for your wife as Christ did the church. And, and there's also, there's also we want to make sure that everyone understands that uh, you can be uh, an elder in a Christian church and not be married at all. Mm -hmm. You can be a eunuch or you can just not be married, but the rules of conduct are 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 
harder on you than the married couple. And I won't get into why that is biblically, but the, the standard for you singles is extreme, where things that are forbidden for you singles is permissible in the marriage bed. So we have this, we have this whole thing that needs to be understood. So if you're not married, don't withdraw from your calling. Paul was not married. Uh, uh, Peter was married because he prayed for his mother-in-law that, and the fever left. So we know he was married. Now, we don't hear a lot about his wife, but the issue is this. There is a commitment that comes, and I've seen the snare, that a man just decides he's called to God, bless God, and everybody would get over it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. But, but the principles of the kingdom, he's not living at home. And, and, his, and it, it's, a, there's, there's, it's a hypocrisy. So the, the kingdom of God is not a theory. It's an application of truth. And so we don't come bringing theory. We come bringing an expression of what works. And, and the Bible gives us the tools to know the rules of how we think, how we speak, and how we act, and our conduct, in our relationship with God, and with ourselves and with others. And so this is key to this. So if your God is calling to you, uh, prepare to bring the whole world under your feet, because you're going to have to experience the full spectrum of mankind in all levels. And it's exciting to be able to meet people like that. And, you know, I just want to say to all of the, we've, we have talked about a lot of, this is kind of the heavier portion of all this because it's so serious, because it is, it's very serious. Calling, a calling of God is serious. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you, it has been the most fun, the most adventurous. Yeah. It's been the most challenging, you know, but the thing is, is you're not alone, okay? Number one, you've got the whole Godhead at your disposal pretty much because they're just waiting to work with you, but you got us too. Mm -hmm. So, hey. Again, the key word earlier today, we would love to release you. Will you, will you release yourself to God? Wow. You know, I, I guess what I'm hearing out of what y'all are all sharing is, you know, before somebody would make this type of commitment, they need to really be thoughtful and make a commitment to communicating with, with their family. And, and, you know, you can't think through every scenario that's going to happen. That's impossible. But, but there has to be a little bit of forethought, a little bit of foresight, as to what's coming. And you shared some things that maybe they had not a thought about that they could think about. I have a scripture. You got a scripture, okay. In the multitude of counselors, there is great safety. It's good. So that way you're not stuck with your own feelings, emotions, or conclusions. You can use even us as a sounding board of where your thoughts are. Our job isn't to control you. Our job is to serve you. Because the great boss came from heaven to serve us. Mm. And that's, that's our heart. We're not going to try to control you. The Bible will control you. That's called sound doctrine. And that's sound doctrine, isn't it? So we're not going to change God's word for ourselves or for anyone. However, our job isn't to dictate your conscience. The Holy Spirit rules your conscience based on Scripture. So we want to release you, goofy I, if I could quote a scripture, it'd be ordinary goofy people doing extraordinary things in the name of Jesus according to the will of the Father as a work of the Holy Spirit. This is the bottom line. That's excellent stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. You know, so thank you for sticking with us all this time here. And what we want to do as we close up is, uh, Pastor, I'm going to ask you, for those of them that are ready to take the next step, Okay, what, what does the logistics of that look like? What, what website do they need to go to? What form do, do they need to fill out? What, what, they, what, should they be, what should they be doing? If you'd like to engage with and respond to what you're hearing, uh, we've facilitated the website Acts Global. That is spelled A-C-T-S Global, G-L-O-B-A-L.com. And it's all one word, AxGlobal.com. On there, you will see that as you scroll down, it's a bit of a narrative. You'll see there's an explanation and some of the, the sound bites on what Axe is and what it isn't. 
And as you progress uh, through, you'll see the tenets of what we believe. You'll see um, that there's actually a portion of our bylaws that is up on the website. So if you're interested in what is the sound doctrine that we've written down, that is a segment that you would need to really engage with and say, do I really agree with this? And as you proceed down, you'll see that there's an, an actual link to, uh, to apply. Now, to apply... It is encouraged that you just be very thoughtful and prayerful about it because um, being thorough in it, we really ask quality questions about your journey. Your journey is very important to us. So as, as you're putting information down, uh, it's all captured. And as you hit send, it's about a 40-minute process to, to go through, I, I would say, 30, 40 minutes. And we'd like to know as much as we can. And then we'll capture that application. Now, that doesn't immediately engage you as an, a participant with Axe, but it comes before this team here. And we look over the applications to say, hey, um, what do you all think about this? We're going to, this is, this is a potential, this is somebody who's hungry to serve. And as we in, uh, digest your, your story and as we get to know who you are more, then that's when we'll reach out and say, hey, this is after the evaluation. We'd like to say, hey, can we have a further dialogue? Can we extend uh, more information to you? Can we help you understand what ordination means if you're not ordained? Um, if you're already existing church, your existing pastor, elder, and you like what you're hearing about being associated with the Acts group. Acts is, again, association of churches, teaching and serving. You find yourself desirous to be like-minded in what you're hearing today You'd go through the same process, apply, but obviously the ordination, we'd, you don't need to be reordained, okay? You're already called, you're already serving, serving God. But we'd like to know what is drawing you to be in, a, uh, in this association. So um, that, these are just the, the basic beginnings, and, but that piece down at the bottom of that website would, uh, after you read through, there's going to be a video you can view if you'd like to. If you're like, hey, I've already heard enough. I just want to apply. Just go straight. You'll, you'll see an application <laughs> button right down there, and you go all the way down, and you'll see that you can just apply. So it's very mobile-friendly. If you have questions, reach out to us uh, on email and uh, are also on phone and it's and we'll get back with you awesome thank you pastor yeah. john yep pastor henry would you close us in prayer father <clears throat> the fields are white to harvest the laborers are few father i ask that you raise up <clears throat> servants, not hirelings, not desirous of vain glory, but at the heart of the great shepherd, the heart of the Father, who so loved the world that he gave. Jesus, you left your cushy place in heaven as the word. Oh, you've gone back there in great power. But you laid your life down. You knew it before you came. Because a prophet spoke. And you knew you were the man. Father, I ask that your spirit be released into the world to those that would view this presentation. Because if they're not called by your spirit, it's not worth it. You know every one of us from the foundation of the world. I'm a prodigal son, preacher's kid that was a prodigal son, age 38. You sent your spirit, and I bent my knee. Father, let's not go by man's wisdom or his ordinations or his whatever, but let us be led by your spirit. Because when we're born again and the Spirit of God is released, we are the sons and daughters of the Father. And you saw us and you understand us and you know who we are. We may not know who we are, but you do. And so, Father, I ask you would take this presentation and stir deeply the hearts of men and women, even young people, that you're preparing for their 
life as an adult. Even children would hear this and say, when I grow up, let it spread like wildfire through the earth. Let people begin to talk about this initiative that Hope of the Generations is starting so that we can fulfill the great question, the great initiative, and that is this. When the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith in the earth? Father, I ask that you take this simple expression of your love that's worked through us for these many years and the maturity that you've had patience in working with all of us, that we begin to mature in our mission, mature in our calling. But we had to start somewhere. And that as this comes, that you allow existing places of assembly and new places of gatherings of those with an elder appointed to lead them and to teach them and to feed them and to begin to perfect them according to the mandate of Ephesians. That you begin to open the hearts worldwide, not in this generation, but in every generation until the Lord comes. Let it begin now. And let this become a place that people can come that are safe places, not of an organization, but of a living organism where you're there by your spirit to accomplish the hope of many generations that was prepared for us from the foundation of the world that we now want to walk in now. We ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Henry. Thank you all so much for joining us. It has been a very special time for us, and we hope it's been a special time for you. On behalf of Hope of the Generations Church, we bless you, and we look forward to walking this journey with you.